Well, good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the City Council meeting tonight. And uh, before we begin, could we have a roll call, please? It'll take just a second. A roll call, please. Excuse me. Councillor Bettine? Here. Councillor Berkey? Here. Councillor White? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Musick? Here. Mayor Marbury? Here. Uh, before we begin our proclamations, I've invited the 416 crew to come to City Council tonight to uh, make some um, explanations and give, communicate to our community. So if you would please come to the podium and uh, and tell everyone your name, and we're so happy that you're here. We appreciate you coming tonight to City Council. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Pachota, and I uh, currently serve as the incident commander for both the 416 and the borough fires. Um, we've been uh, been here for uh, 11 days now um, since we assumed command of the fire. Um, and I'm pleased to report that we continue to increase our containment. At end of shift tonight, uh, the 416 fire will move from 30 to 35% contained. Uh, there are still no loss of structures. Uh, and crews are continuing uh, some really, really good work trying to uh, take the steam out of the south and southwest portions of the fire down above Falls Creek, up the 171 road with outstanding progress being made today. Um, the management of these large fires is, is really complex, uh, and we absolutely cannot do it uh, alone by ourselves. And so uh, over the 11 days that we've been here, I think every single person on our team is um, so happy and humbled by the support that we've got not only from the citizens of La Plata, San Juan counties, Montezuma County, um, but the, the cooperation that exists between all levels of government, from local government to state to other federal agencies. And it's, uh, it's just been a really, really good experience. So um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but there's currently um, still 847 personnel uh, assigned to the um, 416 fire, uh, 179 still assigned to the borough fire, totaling just over a thousand folks. It's 1,026 people still committed. Um, however, uh, the demob of resources is starting to occur as the threat to values at risk, which are homes, private property, and other infrastructure, continues to be reduced. So um, that's a good thing. Um, Again, the 416 fire at about 1,500, we were estimating at 34,161 acres based on last night's IR flight. And again, 35% contained. Uh, the borough fire is currently estimated to be 3,715 acres and is 15% contained. The two fires together uh, total 37,867 acres. Uh, in the management of, of fires, um, when we accept a delegation of authority from the jurisdictional responsible authorities, um, those documents spell out some pretty specific direction um, in which we're tasked to follow. And uh, obviously, um, our first priority um, was to take care of uh, incident responders and the public and let there be no, no uh, harm to any of those folks. Um, when you have the kind of fire behavior, the amount of structures that were imminently at risk, uh, to be able to stand here right now and uh, be able to say that there has been no ac injuries to any personnel or the public um, is, for me personally, what success looks like. Um, that's what matters is those folks. Um, and then we have some geographic area priorities. So all along, the task for us has been to keep the fire west of 550. Uh, 550, the fire is still on the other side of it, where it's supposed to be. Uh, the north end protect, 
protect the, the values at risk up there, homes, private property infrastructure. There's been nothing lost. The South End, same story. Uh, with the change in weather that we got, um, our operations folks um, surged a whole bunch of, of uh, resources into the South End. And instead of having to uh, implement a, a totally indirect kind of a strategy, we're grabbing the fire edge direct with a number of hotshot crews. Uh, high risk. Um, however, there's a high probability of success, and so um, I think I, I don't want to get into the operational briefing, but um, crews made some serious progress on that, that today, and that will really help secure the south and southwest side of the fire. So um, in closing, we'll continue to meet our objectives over our remaining time here. Uh, we're humbled to have had the opportunity to work with so many people. Uh, who came together and worked for a common goal. And uh, I'm not sure what right looks like sometimes, but from my humble personal perspective, this is what good government looks like when we all work together. So that's all I have, ma'am. Well, thank you. I would like to have you call your rest of your crew up here. We'd like to recognize them at City Council. So would you come to the podium? Tammy? Please come and introduce yourself to our community. You know, we, we know there are firefighters, and, but this is an opportunity to see your face and get your name and tell you how much we appreciate you. Go, go Hello, I'm Matt Genoviak. I am the Columbine District Ranger here on the San Juan National Forest, and it's an honor to be here tonight. Good evening. I'm Ken Greger, I'm Operations Section Chief Trainee. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Coppice with the Colorado Air National Guard. And good evening, I'm Tammy Randall Parker, liaison officer for the team. Let's give them a big round of applause. Yes, please go, so please go forward. Turn it over to Ken, you're all in Got it. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so what we thought we would do so um, people can get a little bit more understanding or clear uh, picture of what we're up against. Mm -hmm. At times with the fire, we, uh, we're going to go ahead. First off, we're going to show you really quick. It's a progression map from, uh, from what date, Walker? Uh, from uh, the 31st up through uh, basically current. And so what this will do is it'll just show you an illustration of each day of how much the fire, the growth on the fire. So that's showing the, the fire perimeter and the growth. And then what we thought we'd do is we just have a couple pictures and a few videos that we put together from some aerial footage that shows um, the fire and, and kind of the, the complex fuel train, the topography and uh, fuels that the folks are up against out there. So you get a little bit more of a bird's eye view and then we'll go a quick Google Earth flyby presentation of the incident. So here up on the, uh, on the upper left there, that would be the Burrow Fire. Uh, also known as Branch 2, and then the 416 fire. You want to start and, that? Yeah, and we'll, we'll do the video first. Right? Sure. We'll go ahead and show a, a video footage of what would be uh, referred to on the map as Division Hotel in Delta, which is uh, still the area on the fire in Delta where the folks are working. So what you're looking at here on this video it is so about four days ago, five days ago. This here is um, Falls Creek Ridge, where we uh, were able to keep the fire utilizing fixed swing aircraft, retardant, and helicopters to keep it in check there long enough. The strategy was uh, the weather event was coming in. That'll moderate our fire behavior. And then we switched uh, our strategy and tactics. <coughs> the indirect in Division Hotel towards a direct line construction, which those nine hotshot crews are currently up there. 
uh, the last report before I walked in, they're going to have all the saw line in or right close to it by the end of shift, and they should wrap up the direct and a little piece of indirect line up there um, by early midday tomorrow. So this just shows some of the fire behavior and the, the fuel type up there. It's a, like I said, pretty, pretty tough ground to be uh, fighting fire in. So the days where it looked like the column may have been coming a little bit closer to the community, this was the, uh, the culprit there that was uh, causing all the smoke and stuff. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to take you around the fire perimeter on a Google Earth presentation, just talk about a little bit of the high points and some of uh, the challenges that we had with the incident. The first one here in uh, Division Alpha would be Hermosa. And uh, obviously, um, the, one of the biggest challenges there were the multiple structures uh, that, that were on the hillside there. And the folks were able to successfully um, pull fire down off the hill in the area, um, cut some control feature lines, either by dozer line or hand line. And then as the fire backed down off the slope, we applied a little bit of fire onto the landscape to, uh, to mitigate and burn the fuels between the structures and the main fire. And the folks were very successful in, in those operations. Um, like Todd said, uh, no structures lost uh, during this incident. So we'll go up towards, so now what we're, you're basically seeing is the fire perimeter as we go north on the 550 road. And uh, once again, multiple um, structures on the west side of the uh, home, and you'll see the little black lines going up around DP um, 94 and 1. Those are uh, where they stuck containment lines, dozer lines or hand lines around structures. And then as the fire, uh, you know, back down the slope once again, the resources placed a little bit of fire, we call it the burnout operation, around that structure to keep the structure from burning. This would be referred to terminology as a, a classic point protection for for these structures. So numerous ones as we go up the 550 corridor towards the north. And then we pull up a little bit here. Um, and we'll go to that Y, Division Y. Uh, then the, the last um, feature that's just south of Electra, uh, Electra there uh, by DP33, that's a part of the fire that was um, very challenging, extremely steep terrain going up the, the rim there. We could not insert people, just the, the risk was far too high. And so we utilized the uh, rotor wing aircraft on that to just keep putting bucket work, bucket work, and uh, knocking that down and securing it up into the, uh, the rock wall there. That has been very successful. Um, as of now, and then of course the weather that came in, we we're very glad to see that. And uh, that really helped out a lot. So we're feeling um, a high level of confidence that uh, that was the right strategy and that'll continue uh, to hold the fire perimeter there for the foreseeable future. So then what we wanted to show was when we talk about indirect line, as we move up into X-ray, uh, because of the landscape and, and the topography where we couldn't do a direct strategy, we, uh, we utilized the road systems um, and made uh, control features or indirect line, and we came out through up to the top of Castle Rock with hand line, and then the black line you see is a combination of, of dozer line, and we utilized the Feller Bunchers, Temcos, to remove some of the timber type and then hand crews to clean it up and prep it for future potential uh, back burn um, if needed. So those indirect lines are in protecting the uh, Purgatory Ski Resort and some other critical infrastructure there. And it goes up and ties into the, uh, the 578 road. And then once you see up to the Hermosa um, camp there, you'll see those black lines <clears throat> on the ridge reaching out to the north northeast. Those are addi additional control features we put in once again with the dozers and some feller puncher Timcos to if the fire was to come, we would be able to burn that and, and steer the fire up into the high country, into the, the goat rocks up there. And once again, keep the fire from spreading to the east or back to the south, threatening purgatory and the other communities um, at risk up there. 
So that was our suppression strategy on the north side of the fire. The little lines you see there, that's what we refer to as a branch break. So then we'll just come around into a division hotel and everything that's out uh, from along the west flank there in between the borough fire and, uh, and the 416 fire, there's just no good um, reasonable or feasible options to go direct or indirect in there. So for the remainder of, uh, of the course of this fire, uh, the fire out there will just do its thing in the, you know, and, and burn through some of the drainages. And there's no values at risk out there in terms of, of critical infrastructure, like, you know, homes and stuff like that. So we'll uh, just let the fire do what it wants to do out there. Like I said, through the rest of the, the course till the monsoons hit. And then we're going to jump down and pull up a little bit on Echo so you can see. Now we're down um, Division Echo Foxtrot, <clears throat> which is on the south side of the incident. And once again, we were able to um, pick up a couple alternative A and B lines. That's why you see two of them. Those lines are in play once again for our backup contingency lines. Should um, uh, the work they're doing in Delta and or hotels, so... If we work backwards, we basically have four options here. The bottom line in Echo, and then we've got another a line up above, and then we'll talk about Division Hotel, which was our original um, strategy up until we, uh, we got the moisture we were utilizing, the 171 road on the ridge line um, up the slope. And the, the intent there was to, uh, to do a firing operation once again. On that scale, we would refer to that as a, as a more of a backfire. It's a little bit larger landscape burning to reduce the fuels. Um, it was a, definitely a viable option, but in all honesty, our probability of success there we felt was moderate at best. So um, we, we continued to hit the fire's edge on the Falls Creek Ridge with the retardant and uh, supporting that with helicopters. And then once the rain came in and moderated the fire behavior and any threat for it to make any, uh, you know, any significant run, we all had a, uh, I guess you'd call it a strategy tactics meeting with nine um, interagency hotshot superintendents and uh, safety, the ICs, and we collectively uh, came up with a risk versus benefit, risk versus reward, and looked at um, what, what would be the highest probability of success to keep that fire up on the ridge, and we unanimously came up with going direct on that uh, piece of land. <coughs> and so it'd be di direct along the red fire perimeter and a little bit of indirect line up towards uh, the top of the ridge. As of, like I said, when we came in today, all the saw line would be in. They should complete the direct and indirect line uh, by midday tomorrow. And if we go up to the top, the indirect line would move from the fire's edge up to the 171 <coughs> road. So we'll pull up a little more walker. Yep. And it would be coming off the edge of the ridge, connecting it up above DP 11, which met our normal intent um, for utilizing the, the main ridge. So. What, we, what we've accomplished by that is we've taken um, most all the risk out of play of that fire wanting to spread down into the drainage um, and, then, and then wanting to, once it's in the drainage, we're kind of at the mercy of it and the, the wind, if it wants to run up the ridge or down the, the canyon there, once again threatening the critical infrastructures. And, uh, and, and as well, in Junction Creek, that's a, a pretty main player um, with the, you know, burning in the canyon and then potential for erosion and all kinds of other problems that um, are associated with having a severe uh, burn within the drainage and watershed. So uh, we feel really good about the plan. The folks, um, like I said, are implementing it. And uh, that's, that's what we've done up till today. And it's been a very challenging fire since we uh, assumed command. And, the folks have done a great job, and uh, we have had no time loss injuries, to my knowledge, to date. And uh, given the fuel type, the terrain, the by numbers, um, that's a, a pretty remarkable safety record for, for any incident. So 
um, hats off to the the troops and the men and women that made it all happen. And of course, our commander who uh, keeps us keeps us straight. And it's it's been a great it's been a great not a good fire for you guys, but it's been a very rewarding fire for us in our accomplishments. Any questions? I think you said you were changing uh, commands <coughs> coming week. Would you address that, please? Pardon? Yeah, so um, my team, uh, most teams uh, are on 14-day limit, so our 14th operational period uh, will be on Thursday. Uh, so we will transfer command at 0600 on Friday morning uh, to incident commander Joe Reinars. Uh, Joe leads one of four uh, teams that are called NEMO teams. NEMO is N-I-M-O, uh, and it stands for National Incident Management Organization. Uh, they are permanent full-time Washington office staff. Um, they're a detachment of the Washington office, and their, their whole job th 365 days a year is uh, wildland fire management, training, development, and a host of other things within their portfolio. They bring a smaller group of folks than I do, but one of their niches is they're able to substitute people um, because there's four of them. So we can theoretically, if the fire was, was going to stay there and be any kind of a concern, Nemo can stay here beyond 14 days, bring in two people, give them days off, and, and rotate. So you have that continuity of operation. You have the ability. Um, to stay with it for the long haul, and uh, they'll, they'll do a fine job. All of them, all eight of them, on, or nine on their command and general staff, are all type one qualified, just like, like all my folks are. So uh, you'll be in good hands. There'll be a lot of people that we're going to leave behind, not for my team, but other people who come in to help us, to help with that transition, who know the local players, who know the relationships, who know the ground. So. Uh, we do this a lot, um, transferring command and transitioning with other teams. And I, I can assure you that I will make sure that they understand the importance of partnerships and relationships and keeping you all informed. Will the command still be up at Animus Elementary School? Yeah, for the time being, Joe and I have already talked since the San Juan National Forest has placed the order for them. So my recommendation is until uh, Chief's wife says we're no longer welcome, to uh, kind of stay the course up there uh, because if something happened where the fire got active again and they needed to scale up, it's all there. It's a, you know, a turnkey operation and it's worked really well for us. So. And do you anticipate the, the firefighters, the 800 or so thousand uh, to, to uh, change, go home? What, what yeah, there's a bunch of them that are coming up on 14 days. Uh, and they're tired, they miss Father's Day, just like a whole bunch of folks did. So uh, they work their, their tails off and they're, they're due some, some time with, with uh, family and friends. Thank you so very, very much. Do any of the counselors have any questions or comments? Questions, just thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it very much. Thanks for having us. And thank you for taking your, your precious, valuable time to come to City Council. We really appreciate it. What an honor and so much uh, relevant and good information has been coming out uh, so frequently to reassure our community. Well, I'm going to be continuing with a proclamation at the uh, podium. And Brian Garcia, would you please come forward? Brian is the board chair for the Four Corners Alliance for Diversity, and he will be accepting the Durango Pride Week proclamation tonight. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. This proclamation, Durango Pride Week, June 21 through 24 of 2018. Whereas Durango Pride is an opportunity for our entire town to celebrate and recognize the diversity of our community and to promote and advocate 
for the message of acceptance, civility, dignity, and respect for all people. And whereas the Durango community is a diverse public that includes people of all races, ethnicities, beliefs, national origins, ages, ages, genders, and sexual orientations, and whereas our community strives for inclusiveness and acceptance of all of our people, and whereas we embrace and celebrate our individual identities and our commonalities, I would encourage the Durango community to unite in solidarity and common purpose to celebrate the diversity, shared humanity, and civil rights of all people. Now, therefore, I, Sweetie Marbury, Mayor of Durango, do hereby proclaim June 21 through 24 as Durango Pride Week in Durango, Colorado. Thank you, Ryan. Would you like to say something? Um, yeah, that'd be amazing. Please come right here. The microphone will pick you up. Okay. Um, so, um, first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for having us and for making this proclamation. Um, I could talk about Durango Pride and all the awesome events we're having, so if you're interested, you're more than welcome to join DurangoPride.org. But more importantly, I would like to talk about why this is important. With LGBTQ youth, they are bullied three to four times more than the general population. If we look at LGBTQ individuals and in health disparities, they tend to be completely different from uh, heterosexuals as well as people who are cisgender. If we look at people who are transgender, about 50% of them will attempt suicide at some point in their life. This is not okay. Um, I grew up just south of here in Aztec, New Mexico. I was one of those youth who hated this aspect of myself that I couldn't change, who took this hate that was in the community that was um, throughout society, and I internalized it. I remember staying up late at night praying to God to either make me straight or to um, kill me, essentially. And I firmly believe that no one deserves to go through that. I would like to uh, emphasize the importance of organizations such as like this, such as the, for the Four Corners Alliance for Diversity as well as the Rainbow Youth Center. They are out here every day changing lives, making our community a better place and sharing love, whether it is a youth that's been kicked out of their home and we need to find a place for them to stay, or just a place where youth can go to be themselves, where they don't have to worry about shame and stigma and being who they are. Um, so through this proclamation, I view this as a step towards showing the community that our city stands on the side of love, that we stand on the side of acceptance. And I just want to thank you all so much for having us here and for uh, acknowledging Durango Pride Week. So, thank you yeah, very much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. The next part of the agenda is called the Consent Agenda. The con Consent Agenda is intended to allow the City Council by a single motion to approve matters that are considered routine or non-controversial. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member requests an item be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Items removed from the consent agenda will be considered under agenda item number six. Uh, Ms. Phillips, would you have a, a reading of the consent agenda, please? Item 4.1 through 4.3 are approval items. 4.1. The minutes from the regular meeting of June 5th, 2018. 4.2, the minutes from the study session of May 22nd, 2018. 4.3, the 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the City of Durango and the 2017 Financial Statements for the Durango La Plata County Airport. Items 4.4 through 4.10 are discussion and possible action items. 4.4 concerns Resolution R-2018-23, authorizing additional appropriation to the General Fund for the Community Development Block Grant, H6-CDB-16038. 4.5 concerns approval of the Lohr Foundation Grant for an update of the Ewing Mesa Plan and Resolution R-2018-24, authorizing an additional appropriation to the general fund for the grant. 4.6 concerns resolution R-2018-25, authorizing an additional appropriation to the general fund for a Colorado Department of Law post grant and proposed project cost in excess of the amount budgeted in the 2018 budget. 4.7 concerns resolution R-2018-26, 
authorizing additional appropriation to the Transportation Services Capital Projects Fund for Intelligent Transportation System Enhancement. 4.8 concerns resolution R-2018-27, authorizing additional appropriation to the Airport Enterprise Fund for an airport race and charges project costs in excess of the amount budgeted in the 2018 budget. 4.9 concerns an implied consent agreement for water services at 186 Moose Lane. 4.10 concerns amendment to the 2018 pay and classification plan, reclassifying the current transit operations manager to transit supervisor. Item 4.11 is a request for a public hearing to consider the granting of an easement to Cedar Networks for the installation of a fiber optic conduit west of Settle Street, and the proposed date for this public hearing is July 17, 2018. 4.12 is final approval of Ordinance 0 12 amending Section 23-71 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Durango, for purposes of making the section consistent with the ballot language approved by voters in 2015, extending and amending the one-half cent sales tax originally approved in 1999 and declaring an effective date. And we have one addendum, addendum item, which is number 4.13, and it's a discussion and possible action item concerning the cancellation of the July 3rd, 2018 City Council meeting. Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Would any council like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Madam Mayor, we've got a citizen request 4.3. You take it and remove it from the consent agenda. All right. Uh, anything else? I'd like to have a motion, please, to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item 4.3. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. And 4.3, as Ms. Phillips stated, was the approval of the 2017 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the City of Durango and the 2017 Financial Statements for the Durango-La Plata County Airport. Uh, there was a citizen who wanted to address the council. Councilor Berkey? That's my understanding. Okay, please come forward and state your name and address. Mayor Barber, John Simpson, 1831 Crescent Drive. I'm here to discuss the 2017 CAFR as it discloses potential charter violations that were, were violated in 2017. Article 5, Section 9 of the City Charter allows the City Manager to amend budgets within a department, but requires Council action to approve additional appropriations for departments that exceed their budget approved by City Council. The City, city Manager cannot unilaterally transfer money from one department <coughs> to another. Any change in total to a fund or departmental appropriation within a fund requires city council approval. A department that exceeds its budget must have an additional appropriation from council. Page 100 of the 2017 CAFR shows that the city manager exceeded his budget by $77,000 and that the finance department overspended <coughs> its budget by $50,000. These excesses should have been brought to your attention and formal action should have been taken. In addition to the fact that the charter says so, common sense says budget overages should be addressed. The charter also says the city manager shall provide a monthly statement of, to determine compliance with budget <coughs> requirements and to determine the final condition of the city. Additionally, state law requires you to provide a comprehensive annual financial report. The charter does not say the city manager may provide a CAFR in lieu of the December monthly report six months after the end of the year's <coughs> finished. When the internal numbers from the prior year are delivered to the auditor early in the <coughs> current year, they should also be delivered to you, along with the manager's announcements, <coughs> analysis of the prior year. If changes need to be made in the current year operations based on the year-end financials, they should be made in February, not July. The actual delivery of the completed CAFR in June should just be a formality. The auditors should not be changing the numbers if staff is required to significantly change things 
from the internal financials to get a clean opinion from the auditor, the council needs to be made aware of the problems and insist that the processes change. Mayor Marbury. Thank you very much, Mr. Sampson. Okay, with that. Uh... Um, no action. I recommend approval 4.3. Okay. Uh, approval of the comprehensive annual financial report for the city of Durango and the 2017 financial statements for the Durango La Plata County Airport. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Bricky? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Moving into public participation. This section of the agenda is set aside for the public to provide comments or ask questions regarding items that do not otherwise appear on this agenda. City Council will not respond to questions from the dais. Citizens should address their comments directly to City Council. Citizens wishing to speak during the section of this agenda shall sign in prior to the start of the meeting, identifying their name and address on the form provided at the meeting. Citizens will be called individually by name by the mayor to come to the podium to address the city council. Comments are limited to three minutes. The city manager will signal a 30 second remaining by raising his hand. Any audio visual materials must be provided to the city clerk on or before noon the day of the meeting. Um, Kate Halleck, Kate Halleck, would you please come to the podium and state your name and address and speak to the council, Kate. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kate Halleck and uh, I am a resident at 2703 West 2nd Avenue. Um, I realized through that process that I believe the topic that I was going to address is not on the public hearing um, topics. It's uh, around the homelessness population, but it's currently at the evacuation center. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did draft up a statement that I would like to submit to the city council, um, unless there is space to be able to speak on it at this point. So I this is like, your opportunity to speak. This okay. is okay, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> even though it's not on the agenda. Th that's right. Okay. That's, um, that's why you're here. Okay. Great. So the city manager can start timing when you start speaking. Thank okay. you for asking all those clarifying questions. Great. No problem. Okay. Um, so as I said, I did draft a statement. We uh, have been um, supporting different organizations that have been volunteering with the homeless uh, population that has moved from the camp up on the hill down to um, the evacuation center through the process of the fire. And um, we wanted to just provide an update of what has been happening uh, within the camp, within the context of that community, um, and be able to answer any questions. Um, primarily, I just want to um, make the statement, open the dialogue and the conversation, continue to talk through this process, as we're experiencing a lot of transition. <laughs> um, the campers have um, been notified, I believe, today that they are to relocate, and um, we are very curious where they will be relocating to. Um, we want to respect your guys' decisions and the process that you have gone through uh, thus far, and um, just want to keep that dialogue open. So um, we have seen incredible results, I feel like, um, with employment, um, and also the, the campers that have chosen to operate as a family or as a cohesive unit to move from the um, community up on the hill down to the location. So they've chosen to um, stick together and they've had more success. I, I really believe and um, would like to attest to the different um, camp managers and at Aber and many other people that have been a part of training up leadership so, so that they're more successful. Um, it is a really challenging situation and I know you guys are facing a lot of um, yeah, different opinions, and so we just want to come together and support you um, and see what is a good solution to, to come to um, in this time. So, again, there are some testimonies here on this um, statement and then um, consideration for a location that we'd like to consider. Um, I think it may have pr prior been considered, so just opening that dialogue. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. I, I had a question. Yeah. Are you with an organization or are you a volunteer? I didn't state that. Yeah, I am a um, citizen of Durango. Uh, I work with Durango House of Prayer uh, here in the community. Um, I previously worked for Local First, 
um, and now I'm working at a different financial firm. But um, yeah, just mainly uh, interested in um, concerned citizens okay, on the topic. So. All right, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. And do we have a copy of that? Yes, there? just give it to Ms. Phillips. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rick Colson. Hi, I'm Rick Colson. I'm a resident at 2560 West 2nd Avenue, Unit B. Um, I'm actually with here with Kate. I served with her. Um, I moved here about five months ago and I joined the Rango House of Prayer in the homeless outreach. Um, and just what I've seen in the last month, um, I just wanted to give a testimony as to what I've seen in the community and at the camp among, amongst the campers. Um, I just, uh, I've seen a lot. I, they've really come together. Um, it, they've really come together, and uh, as she pretty much as she previously stated, um, a lot of them have found employment, um, and I really think that there there is a sense of pride that they have taken in their community um, since they had that permanent location and a place that they could kind of call home for a little bit, even if it was temporary. A lot of them. Um, or just you know, as you know, as you know, um, a lot of them are employed, but they just it, housing is very expensive in Durango, and so we, I just wanted to stress the importance um, that uh, on on actually relocating them and finding a uh, somewhat permanent solution for them. Um, I know we uh, we talked about I, I I knew there was talks about um, a field by Mana. I'm not sure the exact location beforehand. Um, there is also talks about permanent housing going in in that field. Um, and so, but as far as the process goes to get them to that point of permanent housing, um, that it's going to be a couple months out at least. So I would just uh, ask that you consider that spot to move to move these people to just, just for the time being and so that they can uh, maintain that sense of community and uh, you know pride and, and things that they've worked so hard for up to this point. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, John Simpson. Mayor White, John Simpson, 1831 Crestview Drive. With the CAFR comes some very important information at the back that's very exciting. We we're just now finding out that the year in cash balance in the water fund jumped again in 2017 by almost $3 million and now exceeds $14 million. There must be an end game to this situation. Is it when the fund balance is $20 million? Is it when you have enough for a water treatment plant? <clears throat> there is no clear direction with this fund. Debt was supposed to be issued years ago. There is talk of another rate increase because you didn't do a rate increase last year. It is time to take a serious look at the fund. The CAFR shows over $5 million of capital acquisitions occurred in the water fund. To the best of my knowledge, there's been no disclosure of what was acquired. As the CAFR states that there are questions, I have asked the finance director <clears throat> for a list, but my request, is, my request has been ignored. Last year, after many emails, staff produ produced a report listing water projects carried forward from prior years. Shouldn't staff be required to produce an updated list that shows items removed as a result of the 2017 additions? The CAFR also includes an interesting table that tracks the number of full-time employees over time. In 2011, there were 280 city employees. Last year, there were 348. 68 additional employees in the last six years. The rate of growth of the number of employees is much higher than the rate of growth of the population. Please consider including this fact in the public discussions in the effort to push for a tax increase. Last year, <coughs> we passed a property tax because it was argued the 911 calls were going to increase. The CAFR showed that the 911 calls, the level of 911 calls decreased and the population went up. As you go forward with this tax increase, please disclose facts that may rebut the argument that a tax increase is necessary. It's impossible to look into the future. Point out how projections are only guesses. That the previous efforts have led to tax increases overstated <clears throat> the previous efforts that have led to tax increases overstated the problems because they were based on inaccurate predictions. Mayor Marbury. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer McGrath. Hi, 
I'm Jennifer McGrath. I live at 113 Linda Court. Uh, sometimes I complain to my mom that my body just doesn't recover like it used to. I'll be trained and I'll be tired. And she always reminds me that getting older is hard. The only thing worse is not getting older. Um, and I kind of feel like key democratic principles are the same way. I uh, think open meeting laws are probably pretty hard and it makes it pretty hard to get things done. Um, the only thing worse is living in a place where those things are optional. I'm here today to talk about what I perceive to be a violation of those open meeting laws and ask for you to rectify that situation. At the May 1st City Council meeting, Mayor Marv already disclosed some new rules in town. The new rules reduce the ability of the public to speak at council meetings. At the June 5th City Council meeting, Councillor Bettine announced that the decision to make those changes was made at the City Council retreat that was held April 26th and April 27th. Other councillors confirmed this. According to a recent CORA request, agendas and meetings from that retreat are not available. I'm no lawyer, but from my perspective, making policy decisions in that setting violates Colorado's open meeting laws. And even if it doesn't violate the letter of the law, it certainly violates the spirit of the law. I can't imagine how hard it must be to have all of your policy decisions scheduled, recorded in public. As a citizen, I'm so grateful that there are people who are willing to work in those conditions. I don't expect that you to be perfect. I know that you're going to have organic conversations that are going to probably cross the line from chit chat into city business. I just hope that when that happens, you do your best to make it right. To me, making it right means two things. First of all, make your best effort to recreate what happened at that um, retreat. Ask for the staff and yourselves to recreate, as best as you can, minutes of that. Maybe this was the only decision, maybe it wasn't. Just part of making it right means letting the public decide. Secondly, I ask that you rescind the rules effective immediately. If the rules are indeed valuable to running the government, and they may be, we have elected you to absolutely make that call. Just put them on an official agenda, have a proper discussion, invite public comment, and vote on the record. I know this ask is difficult, but open meeting laws are made for a reason. Their alternative is really a bummer. Thank you, Mayor Thank you. Uh Mr. Zink? Thank you all. I'm Ed Zink. I live at 4166 County Road 203. Uh, I've been in the retail business in Durango for 50 years, and you all recognized that earlier this year. Thank you very much. But one of the things I've learned in that 50 years of being in retail business, there's sort of three markets, and, and we as a community and as a city need to take care of all three markets. Approximately one-third of the bit retail business is done by people that live in the city. Approximately one-third is done by people who live in the county. And one-third is done by people who live other places. They come here to visit. The, uh, the recent decision to limit future sales in your water dock to only existing customers, uh, I'm fearful is, is uncomfortable and unpleasant for many of our rural residents. We are in extreme drought. We're gonna have people whose wells are going dry that have never gone dry before, and they're gonna be in a tough position. Uh, I've had the opportunity in my life to live about three and a half years when I had to pack water horseback. Water is very, very precious when you don't have any. And so for these folks in the rural parts of La Plata County, when their wells go dry, that becomes the first thing in their decision making of where they're going to go. And if they cannot put together getting water, shopping, going to the doctor, the other variety of things they have to do, if they can't do that in Durango, they will be doing it in Aztec, Mancus, Farmington, Oxford, I, I ask you to reconsider your position to not have any new customers at your water dock. I have no doubt 
there are challenges to operating the water dock, um, but there are challenges. I mean, the uh, La Paz provided all the water for the air tankers at the uh, at the airport to fight the fire. Pine River hauled all the water in their fire trucks. Uh, Animus Water provided water to fight the fire. Animus Consolidated Ditch provided extra water for the ponds so the helicopters could dip the water out and fight the fire. Those things weren't easy for those people, but they decided it was important and they figured out a way to get it done. I'm asking you <coughs> to figure out a way to make water more available <coughs> to the rural residents of Lavlada County <coughs> who don't need emergency water yet, but they're going to. This drought isn't over. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Sink. The next section is council reports and action, and I am proposing to move those to the very end of the council meeting to until after um, ordinances, and I'd like to discuss that with city council. I think it's, it's a good idea. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Uh, right. um, I'd like to look for a motion from council. I'll make a motion to move council reports and actions to the final item on the agenda okay. after um, Ordinances. Ordinances. Is there a second? Thank you. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes, sir. Um, would this motion be just for this meeting, or do you want that to continue in the future and we can show um, it on the I'm agenda? I'm thinking that we should try it to continue for the future. I would amend the motion to continue for the future. I'll second. All right. Is there a roll call, please? Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Brookie? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Uh, before we uh, get into the next uh, quasi-judicial hearing, I've asked Julie Brown from the Financial Department to come and speak before council. I get to do that. I'm the mayor and also a counselor. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brown. City Council, um, as Mr. Simpson did um, explain, he did request some information on some CAFR, um, on some questions on the CAFR, and if we get citizen requests like that, we bring it to City Council so that everybody um, gets the same information from us. So he asked some very specific um, questions, but most, most of them are related to the water fund. Um, so we will start with, um, his questions were, on the, the first one was on non-departmental expenses. Um, there's about 4.3 million, and um, they're categorized as non-departmental in the CAFR. Um, about 1 billion, about 1.2 million of it is um, in these different types of expenditures. So we have risk management transfers. Julie, can you just explain to the public what CAFR actually yep. is? Yep, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, so um, part of that 1.2 million is risk management transfers. That is our transfers to our internal service fund for our property and casualty and workers comp. Um, we have unemployment expenses in there for that fund, compensated absences, which is those expenditures that we have to book um, for vacation PTO um, that we foresee people to be taking. Um, I stated property and casualty and workers comp insurance. We have administrative um, fees for our warehouse. It's also an internal service fund. We have the administration fees to the general fund for all the support that the general fund um, gives to that enterprise fund. And then we have some capital transfers out. So as you're aware, we do have a capital equipment replacement fund. And if a department buys a piece of equipment, they have to transfer that into the SURF fund for them to manage it. Um, and then we also have capital expenditures in there, which leads me to his next question is, we had three million seventy-five thousand five hundred and ninety-three thousand in capital expenditures that were in that four point two million. Um, this is the list of all of the um, capital expenditures. So the first ten or eleven down to that one point seven million. Those are actual assets that we booked as fixed assets this year. The bottom projects are work in process. So those are projects that we started in 2017, but they were not complete, so they were not booked as assets. They're booked into an asset class called work in process. So those are ongoing projects that are currently underway. 
the next question he had was on capital contributions. So this was a large item in the water fund in 2017. What those are are donated infrastructure assets from developers. So we have developers that have developer agreements. They have to install the infrastructure and then they donate that back to the city. It's not cash coming to us. It's actually an asset that comes in to us. So as um, Mr. Simpson pointed out, there was over, there's about $3,155,206 in capital contributions in 2017 and the water fund alone. Most of those came from Twin Buttes. Um, we had a, they uh, donated a generator. We had water lines at the Arrowhead um, subdivision, which is up off of Rim Drive. We had some water lines at the Durango Grove out in Three Springs. We had some additional water lines from the Three Springs um, subdivision, a booster station for the water tank at Twin Buttes, um, water lines at Twin Buttes, and then the water storage tank at Twin Buttes as, all, as well. So they donated those assets to us, so we have to bring them in as a contribution to be able to vote that asset. <coughs> Were there limitations with these? I see that in the... Was there what? Limita any limitations placed on these donations? Absolutely not. These were just infrastructure. These were pipes. Just get yeah, free, they, free we free. require them to, in to install them, and then we have to book them as an asset. Because they don't need approved to agreement. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah, Bob Dells would be hard-pressed to think that these were paid for by taxpayer dollars <laughs> in any way, shape, or form, because he wrote the checks. That's the that's way I see it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, it was one question on um, the cash flow statement. Um, so there was a little bit of confusion as you, we had $3 million in capital expenditures, but on, on the cash flow statement, it says that we um, had capital acquisitions of $1.2 million. The $1.279 is the actual cash that we paid for assets in 2017. So we had, an we had actually $6.2 million in capital asset additions in the water fund. $1.795 were assets that were sitting in WIP work in process at the end of 2016, so the cash was paid out in 2016. Those projects weren't done, so they go into the work in process, where we're not using cash in 2017. And that cash flow statement is showing what cash we physically used in that year. And then we had the 3.1 million in developer contributions. Again, that was not cash, so it would not show up, <coughs> show up as cash used um, in, in the cash flow statement. So we physically used 1.2 million in cash for capital additions in 2017 in the water fund. <coughs> so then he did also ask for a um, total list of all the capital expenditures of the 5.4 million. This is the list of everything that was capitalized. This is that 3.1 million in developer contributions are on this list, as well as the um, remaining capital expenditures that we um, Ex wrote, you know, took into a physical fixed asset for 2017. Um, he did point out that in the water fund, our payment for services went over budget by $85,800. That the total fund was not over budget. What happened is during the budget time, somehow I missed putting in the warehouse transfer fee in that budget number. Um, but the total fund was under budget. And we obviously had to expend those money so we can keep the internal service fund whole because they use that building. Um, but it was just missed in the budget process. Um, the next question again was the sustainable services fund. Same type of thing. I missed the warehouse in internal transfer fund for some reason. The total fund was under appropriation. Um, I just missed it in the budget process. So it was over budget by 33000 So those were the um, questions that were asked by Mr. Simpson in the email that he sent last Monday night. Um, I was not ignoring him. We just like to bring these two councils so that we can give everybody the same information for citizens that are asking those questions. Thank you, Ms. Brown. I just had a couple of comments. Uh, at the study session when we had the auditor, he used the words a clean audit. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you explain to the community what a clean audit means? So we um, were issued an unmodif unmodified um, audit or opinion in our um, CAPR. So that is the highest level of an audit that you can receive from an independent auditor. Um, they, as he explained to you all, you know, they go through all the trans, you know, the transactions, they look, they're here for a month at a time, or a month in January, three weeks in April. They go through our entire system, every single number that we have. They make sure our policies are being followed. They look at internal control, and we got the highest unmodified opinion. Okay. Uh, city manager, you had a comment? Uh, I did. I had uh, two things I'd like to uh, point out to the public. 
Um, I believe Mr. Simpson, and I, I may have written this down incorrectly, and I apologize if, if I did, uh, said in 2011 we had 211 staff, mm -hmm. and in 2017 we had 248. Uh, I would call the council's attention to the recession. Uh, in 2009, I believe we eliminated 37 positions. So if you add 37 to 211, the number is 248. So we restored those positions uh, as we said we would when we got back on our feet. Uh, the other comment uh, concerns property tax. The city's property tax was 2.507 mills from 19... 81 until last year when the voters approved another 2.5 mills and that increase was not for the city it was for the Durango Fire Protection District it had nothing to do with 911 calls it had to do with fire protection thank you for that clarification I was going to say that that was our tax that was clearly proposed by and received by uh, Durango Fire Protection District it has nothing to do really with the any of the copper, any of the money that comes to us, uh, except that we all enjoy those services, and uh, thankfully so. And uh, it's worth remarking that uh, that is identical to the increase that they asked for their from their members because of the shortfall that they've experienced because of the fall in natural gas prices as well as from the Gallagher Amendment adjustments. Um, and I believe the chief told us last week that um, they're going to get another hit of hundreds of thousands of dollars be, uh, from the Gallagher Amendment in 2019. Uh, so the uh, you know, the property tax increase was simply to say, okay, unless we're going to take that money from the general fund and the whole public process that we're engaged in is about keeping a general fund whole, then um, we needed to do that. And it, since that prop, that property tax is what was being asked for um, the residents in the other districts, uh, we did the same thing, which uh, was everyone was asked for the same increase. And it only passed if it, it passed in the district and in the city. Uh, Ms. Brown, have you provided Mr. Simpson with these? I have not yet. I wanted to If you would you. do that, that would be great. Okay. Matt, uh, I wanted to highlight something, too, for the public and just to make sure I understood it clearly, Julie. Um, when we received the CAFA the other night in the presentation from the independent auditor, one of the comments that I believe he made and you just sort of repeated was that every transaction was actually reviewed, which is something that's not typical as I understood him to describe it and it was a requirement that's based upon a sort of higher level that the city is required to attain based on an award or something like that that we've attained. It's almost like a forensic level of, of review because they look at every transaction, they look at every ledger entry, they look at all your invoices and everything. Is, is that correct? They don't look at every single invoice, but they do look at every transaction. So they have chosen as a firm to go to that higher level, which is why we like them as an auditor as well, because they have gone to that higher level. Um, they made that choice three years ago instead of just coming in and saying, I need 15 samples from here and 20 from there. They get our entire entire general ledger. And they have, you know, right now they have three years of our entire general ledger and they can do data forensics on it to see and try and pull out any type of fraud or any type of um, issue that they're seeing in there. They do look at every transaction. They do not look at every physical invoice electronically. That would just take too much time. That seemed pretty extraordinary. I mean, I've been part yeah, of it is. Years. It's, you know, one of the only firms I know of that does it every year like that. Hmm. The other assertion was that we should have uh, voted essentially to allow you to change a line item in, in your budget for in a, within a particular department. And in my five years on council, we unless you have an, a you know bus in that fund it, in general that requires money from some sort of major transfer, uh, so, those are internal budget corrections in uh, my mind. I, I think for the I'll let Julie comment and then I think for the public's um, edification, uh, we run um, enterprise funds that operate on the fees that are charged by that particular fund, so water, sewer, uh, trash, and recycling. It wouldn't be right to take some money out of trash and recycling and fund a police officer. That's 
what the the rules say, and we, we don't do that. So, uh, Mr. Simpson brought up page 127, which I'm a little confused because that's the capital improvements fund, but he's talking about the general fund on page 99. That's broken down by division. <clears throat> so yes, there were a couple divisions that were over budget, but that's not the entire budget. So if you look at the entire, or the entire department. So if you look at division, yeah, some look like they are over, but if you look at department wide, they are not the way that we have them broken down by department in the capital. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Brown, do you learn something new when you have audits? Absolutely. And do you make improvements when you have audits? Absolutely. We take any advice from them that we, you know, can elicit, and we go to, you know, the national conferences for government finance officers, um, and we try and, you know, bring the document up to, you know, the top level that we possibly can, and our internal controls. Do you have comment? I mean, questions, counselors, for Ms. Brown, concerning the audit that we heard about last week? No, I, I was really pleased to have the audit. It's right here, and um, I mean, there's nothing in here that says a, a word derogatory about the city of Durango or the practices. And as uh, Councilor Bettina said, I mean, virtually every transaction was was evaluated for its appropriateness, its legality, and its uh, correctness. So I, I, just, I don't understand where these accusations are coming from, quite honestly. And to pile on to that, the fact that. Uh, we're charging too much for emergency services is just a bad civics lesson that these allegations are you know, not even in a, aimed at the right direction, the right entity. That's not the city of Durango. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm lost in this, in, in this, but the, thank you for the clarification and the presentation. I might add we're going through uh, as many as the, as the city can afford are going to uh, the uh, CML conference tomorrow. and. Uh, there are some screwed up t towns in this state, <laughs> if you want to, financially, uh, politically, and everything else. And so I would, particularly the financial aspects of this community are well respected all over the state of Colorado. And I, I, there's not a community in the state that would not want Julie Brown in charge of her, their books and run the blank at the helm as city manager. So uh, with, when these things come up, it catches us all a little bit. I was surprised, are we really doing something wrong? or illegal or anything non-transparent. And uh, uh, I can say I feel really well represented and, uh, and we're appreciated around the state and recognized around the state for excellence in bookkeeping. So. I, would, I would add to that that the, one of the things that is, is noted and I believe in the study session agenda doc last week, the auditor is hired to report to the city council. They, are re they receive uh, information from staff and there's a whole long statement of all the different pieces that, of information that they have received. And, but the auditor reports to the city council. And the reason for that is that literally the buck stops here and it is our responsibility, but none of us are accountants. And the, to have uh, external certification year after year that we have unmodified auditor's reports is a, has been from literally day one in my council service been a tremendously reassuring fact. Thank you, Councillor White. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, do you want to say anything? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you Julie. about the about the CAFR. I appreciate that. Okay. We are moving into a uh, quasi judicial hearing, and let me just go over the ground rules with you. Uh, the public hearings are an opportunity for citizens to provide formal input into the City Council's decision-making process. The, form, uh, the format the City Council follows for public hearings is organized to ensure transparency and fairness to all parties. The public hearing portion of this meeting will end at 9.30 unless otherwise extended by motion and if necessary will be continued to either a special meeting or the next regularly uh, scheduled meeting. The City Council welcomes all public testimony relevant to the issue at hand. And the uh, first one is 9.2.1, a public hearing to consider the Woodside condominium annexation. So the staff makes a report first, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Marbury and Council. 
Uh, this is a public hearing to consider a request from the Woodside Condominium Association Board of Directors, who are represented by Hendrina and Leroy Bell, for the annexation of about 2.3 acres of property located at 1900 County Road 240, that's uh, Florida Road. Uh, this is the site of the existing 23-unit residential condominium development known as the Woodside Condominiums. The Woodside condos uh, were reviewed and approved and constructed in the 1980s under the jurisdiction of the county. Uh, the project is served by city water and sewer utilities, which were authorized to them under an implied consent agreement that were entered into in the 1980s. Um, the uh, property is, as I said, currently used for multifamily residential purposes, and along with the zoning, the applicants are requesting a multifamily zone designation RM, which is medium density, and that reflects the existing multifamily use of the property and the existing about 10 unit to the acre density, which is consistent with that zoning designation. Uh, this property is immediately east of the Sunridge townhome project that was annexed into the city in the uh, 2004. Uh, the Planning Commission heard this request at their uh, regular meeting on April 23rd, 2018. There was no public comment, and the Planning Commission voted 5-0 to recommend approval of the annexation and initial zoning standard, uh, subject to some pretty standard conditions of approval as identified in the staff report. Uh, you do have the vicinity <coughs> map, and this is the proposed annexation plat, the draft of the annexation plat. Those are attached to your agenda documentation, as well as the staff report from the Planning Commission meeting and the minutes of that Planning Commission meeting. As far as fiscal impact, the city already provides utilities to this, this property uh, and provides services to the neighboring property at uh, Sunridge, so additional service costs to the city should be neg negligible for this. We will receive some uh, fairly minor increase in property tax revenues from the annexation of this development into the city. Uh, this development and the zoning that's being requested is consistent with the uh, medium density designation of the comprehensive plan. Um, and it's the recommendation of the Planning Commission of the Council by motion, approve the Woodside Condominiums Annexations 1 and 2, and direct the City Attorney to <coughs> prepare the enacting ordinance when notified by staff that all the outstanding issues relative to the annexation have been completed. This is a really simple annexation. Thank you. I'm going to uh, ask the applicant if he would like to speak at this time. <coughs> oh, is that Mr. Bell? That's fine, Mr. Bell. All right. I'm going to open uh, the public hearing now. Would anyone from the audience like to come to the podium and comment? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public testimony. Any questions by city council? None here. Just none checking. Here. Okay. Um, well, I see no questions then. I'm closing the public hearing. And I will ask for a motion from council, please. I'll make a motion to approve the Woodside Condominium Annexations 1 and 2 and direct the city attorney to prepare the enacting ordinances when notified by staff that all outstanding annexation issues have been addressed. Thank you. I'll is second. There a second. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Bettine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Yusuf? Yes. Councilor Brookie? Yes. Councilor Y? Yes. Mayor Montbury? Yes, thank you. We're moving into a quasi-judicial hearing, 9.2.2, a public hearing to consider the Bodo Business Ranch Unit 3, Lot 6A, 1A parcel, a minor subdivision. And staff will present, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Savannah Jameson with Community Develop to consider the subdivision of Bodo Business Ranch Unit 3, Lot 6A through 1A parcel 1. This is on Gerard Street in the Bodo area. Um, it is just east of Scott Brewery, and to the east of that is a vacant <coughs> parcel. Um, existing parcel is zoned light industrial, and all, everything around it is the same. Zoning will remain the same. Um, this is an aerial photo of it. As you can see, um, there's a large vacant parcel to the east of it. Scott is to the west of it. And so the proposal is to take that parcel and divide it into three uniform parcels, all approximately 0.95 
acres. Um, they will have 115 linear feet of street frontage. This meets the requirement of the Land Use and Development Code as the minimum lot area is 12,000 square feet and minimum lot frontage is 50 feet. So staff is recommending approval of the minor subdivision of the Bodo Business Ranch Unit 3, Lot 6A through 1A, Parcel 1, subject to the stated findings and conditions. Include all plat language, plat notes, and easement dedications determined appropriate by city staff in the final plat. All future development beyond the proposed subdivision will be subject to future reviews and approvals in accordance with the requirements of the Land Use Development Code. All written, verbal, and graphic representations of the applicant shall be deemed conditions of approval. Thank you very much. Would the applicant, is the applicant in the audience? No. All right, then I'm going to open the public hearing. Would anyone in the audience like to speak on this? Seeing none, I'm closing the public hearing. Any questions from council? Is, is this the first one that's been subdivided like that out there? Or it's, this has not been a popular thing to do, but uh, it makes some sense for multiple ownerships and densification. Um, I believe it is, although the size is similar to some like across the street. Right, right. But this is, yeah, a variety of sizes out there. I'm sure engineering will look at degrading and drainage and some of the things that plague yes, photo, photo properties in general, but uh, <coughs> I, I particularly like the concept. I would ask, uh, are, the, are those uh, conditions in the staff report or the uh, minutes of the planning commission or do we need to amend the recommended motion to ensure they're incorporated? No, they are in the staff report. <laughs> Any other questions from council? Uh, then at this time, the public hearing is closed, and I'd like uh, a motion from council. I make a motion to approve the Bodo Business Ranches Unit 3, Lot 6A 1A, Parcel 1, Minor Subdivision. Roll call, please. And I, think that oh, should, I believe that should say, with subject to the conditions <coughs> of the uh, planning, committee, com planning Commission staff report. I'll amend my motion and ask to add subject to the conditions in the planning staff report. Now second. I second. second. Okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Brickey? Yes. Councilor Bettine? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Going on to 9.2.3, a public hearing to consider the River Oaks Duplex Townhomes amended preliminary plat. Uh, Thank you. This is a uh, public hearing to consider a request from the current owners of the two duplex units in the River Oaks townhome duplex located at 143 River Oaks Drive. This is at the bottom end of the cul-de-sac in Escalante Crossing. Uh, they're proposing to amend the plat that was originally uh, reviewed and approved last year. Uh, this plat was found to have some surveying discrepancies and some surveying issues. And so all this is is an, is an amended plat to modify the originally uh, approved plat and recorded plat so that the uh, as-built condition of the townhome units are now correctly identified on the, on the plattings. Um, really a simple uh, boundary adjustment type plat. The Planning Commission heard this item again at their May 21st meeting. Uh, there was no public comment. Planning Commission voted 5-0 to recommend 4-0 to recommend approval of the preliminary plat subject to some very standard and minor conditions identified in the staff report. Assuming the council approves this tonight, it comes back to just a staff review at the final plat stage and then we'll forward it on to the mayor for signatures. There's no fiscal impact associated with this minor subdivision. Uh, it's totally consistent with the comprehensive plan and the Escalante Crossing plan development. And it's recognition of the Planning Commission that the Council by motion approved the River Oaks Duplex Townhomes amended preliminary plat and authorized the mayor to sign the mylars, the final plat mylars, upon completion of all final platting requirements as determined by staff. Well, thank you. I would open the, is the applicant here? Did the applicant want to say anything? I don't believe the applicant's present. This okay. was so simple I told them they didn't have to be all there. Right. I can answer any questions you might have. I'm going to open the public testimony. Anyone like to comment? Seeing none, I'm closing the public hearing. And any questions from the council? No. At that point, I'll ask for a motion to approve. 
I'll make a motion to approve the River Oaks duplex townhomes amended preliminary plot and authorize the mayor to sign the final plot milers upon the completion of all final plot requirements as required by staff. Second. I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor Bettine. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf. Yes. Councillor Brickey. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Mayor Marbury. Yes. Uh, moving on to 9.2.4, public hearing to consider the South Fork Storage Lot 4 Minor Subdivision Preliminary Plan. This is another minor subdivision public hearing, preliminary plan public hearing to consider a request from Greg Martin, mm -hmm. who is the current owner of the South Fork Storage property located at 28481 Highway 160. Proposal is to subdivide this property into two lots, one of which would be vacant, one of which the easternmost would contain the existing mini storage uh, property. Planning Commission and City Council uh, considered a proposal to add additional uses to this property last month. At that time, we made a representation that this was the applicant's intent to subdivide the property in this in this regard, and that's where we're moving forward right now with the with the preliminary plan stage. Minor subdivision, two lot subdivision. Uh, there are really no issues or problems with this. Uh, as part of the development, the applicant will be responsible for extending city water main uh, to serve both of the lots, and that will be done uh, through a public improvement agreement and performance bond. But this is, again, a really simple uh, subdivision proposal that's consistent with what we have done in the neighborhoods, consistent with the South Park Character District master plan and also the uh, uh, Crater Plan Development. Planning Commission heard this at their May 21st meeting. There was no public comment. The Commission voted 4-0 to re recommend approval of the preliminary plat, subject to very standard conditions of approval. Uh, again, if the Council does uh, approve this tonight, it will come back just for staff review at the final plan stage, and then we'll uh, present the Mylars to the Mayor for signatures after, after that. There's no uh, fiscal or budgetary impact associated with this request. It is consistent with the City's comprehensive plan in the LUDC, and it's a re recommendation to the Planning Commission that the Council by motion approve the South Fork Stories Lot 4 Minor Subdivision Preliminary Plan and authorize the Mayor to sign the final plat mylars upon completion of all final planning requirements as determined by staff. The applicant is here tonight and a representative is here. I'm going to open the public hearing. Would the applicant like to say anything? Nothing to All right, I'm going to ask for any public testimony at this time. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Uh, any questions from council? If there are no questions, I would like to have a motion, please. I'll move that we approve the South Fork Storage Unit Storage Lot 4 Minor Subdivision Preliminary Plat and authorize the mayor to sign the final plat mylars upon completion of all final plat requirements as determined by staff. Second. Roll call. Councillor Brickey. Yes. Councillor White. Yes. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes, and I, I'm pretty sure I did close that public hearing. Uh, moving on to introduction of ordinances 11.1, an ordinance granting an easement over a portion of city-owned property to La Plata Electric Association to install a new service to 1111 Camino del Rio and declaring an effective date. Staff report, please. I uh, really don't have much of a report. It's, uh, as you heard last week or two weeks ago, uh, they requested an easement from the city to extend power to 1111 Camino del Rio, and it will benefit the city and other property owners. Uh, this will be Ordinance 0-2018-14. I'm looking for a, a motion. I'll move we approve Ordinance 2018-14. Is there a second? I'll second. Roll call, please. Councillor Bettine? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Councillor Brickey? Yes. Councillor Yusuf? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. 11.2 is an ordinance amending the Code of Ordinances of the City of Durango by, by repealing Section 1554F of the Code related, related to removal of limits on jury trials in municipal court and declaring an effective date. So this is ordinance 2018-15, uh, essentially a housekeeping uh, 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 arrangement to make just to clean up the code and eliminate and, and to bring it into compliance with our current practices in municipal code. Thank you. I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 2018-15. I'll second. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Yusuf? Yes. Councilor Bettine? Yes. 
Councillor Berkey? Yes. Councillor White? Yes. Mayor Marbury? Yes. Um, we are moving into council reports and actions. And council, with your permission, I've asked the city manager to bring up uh, an issue. I think there's some people in the audience that have been waiting to hear what's going on. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor Marbury. Uh, what I'm uh, going to discuss is where we go with the um, closing of the shelter. At noon today, the shelter operated by the Red Cross located at uh, Escalante Middle School uh, was closed. Um, I um, had been in contact with the uh, uh, county manager and we, um, we have good communication between the two of us. So uh, she let me know that earlier in the day today, the Board of County Commissioners met and instructed her uh, not to ask uh, the superintendent to request uh, an extension for the homeless to camp at Escalante uh, Middle School. Um, so I called the superintendent and after discussion, uh, he granted us a request um, for a one week extension. Um, I, I also would add to that report that today there was a need to dispatch police um, and I will be talking to the uh, superintendent tomorrow uh, but the superintendent on his good graces was letting people camp there uh, if they're disruptive and misbehaving and committing assaults and whatever um, he's not going to let them stay so that privilege may not be extended to a week that was assuming they would behave um, the sheriff uh, this morning I, I believe and I wasn't at the meeting but I was informed um, intends to close the uh, not only the previous uh, shelter uh, camp uh, up on county owned property but the relocated camp and I would um, remind everyone that all public lands county federal um, state uh, and city are closed under stage three fire restrictions um, at the moment uh, and when the restrictions are lifted it's my understanding that the sheriff will not allow um, people to return to either of those camps on county owned property so tonight uh, and it's a little awkward uh, because things are moving so fast um, the, uh, the uh, I, I think the council has four choices. There may be more, um, but I'll go through those four and that may help help you get your uh, minds around where we are. Um, so some of these have been uh, discussed in great detail. So choice number one would be to open the Lightner Creek shelter. And only last week we had a complete discussion of the uh, health, potential health risk uh, of that site. And staff was instructed to work with CDPH and E uh, and the Department of Energy to come up with a request for proposals uh, that both the federal and state agencies would find acceptable. And uh, I think we discussed uh, the time frame for that could be three or four months. So uh, choice number two would be to return to the social services campus uh, on the land that we considered but rejected that is leased to uh, housing solutions of the Southwest. Uh, and that's the site where the permanent supportive housing project would be located. The developer for that project um, backed out of the negotiations and a substitute developer has now stepped in. So brand new developer, person we have worked with previously is no longer in the deal. This is on the permanent supportive housing? Permanent supportive housing. So that developer um, has advised that there's not enough time to properly get an application in for this round of funding. And he would like to have more time to do a good job to ensure greater success. 
Um, so there were, for the reasons we had discussed in the past, some issues associated with that property. There is one reason that I just found out today that I either forgot or wasn't aware of. Um, so I'll share that so we all have the same information. Uh, and that is the contract between the city and Housing Solutions of the Southwest, which does not provide for uh, a shelter or a camp unless they grant that to us. Uh, the director, executive director of uh, Housing Solutions would have to take that action to their board. Um, so again, we have a timing issue and there's no guarantee uh, that we would have success. Choice number three is new. City staff is not in the social services business. We're not in the housing business. So we're learning a lot as we go along. Um, Kevin Hall um, learned today and shared with me that the Fort Lyons facility uh, in Los Animas uh, is a uh, facility run by the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless and it could accommodate 10 to 15 campers. Uh, we would have to find transportation uh, for them, um, but that facility is uh, a remodeled, a rehabilitated um, veterans home that is now um, offering a number of wraparound services, I think is the term, for uh, homeless people. The fourth option is do nothing. Um, I. Without talking to the superintendent, I don't know if he's uh, still willing to give us a week. Uh, I mean, we're only a few hours into, I mean, noontime is when it closed and already got police calls. Uh, and this is a, a school site. So I, I think we're imposing on him um, something he may not want to tolerate. Um, Escalante uh, Middle School is in the county. So I don't know um, what the sheriff's response is to that. It would be nice if we could share some of those uh, responsibilities. Um, there doesn't appear to be a perfect solution, which seems to be the theme uh, that we've um, discovered over the, the months and years we've been working on this. Um, and staff have um, discussed this, and you know we've we came upon this information um, late in the in the day today. So we haven't had a lot of time, and what I'm sharing with you is pretty much all we know. Uh, but it, it would be our advice when uh, you make a decision of this importance that we do it right and, and do it in a way that is um, acceptable to the community and also respectful of the homeless people. Um, and and I, I couldn't give you any guidance here on the dais of what would be the best option um, we don't control what CEPH and E is going to do. We don't control what Housing Solutions is going to do. We do know that if the homeless people are willing, uh, Fort Lyons will take them. So that's that's what I know. And I don't know, Kevin, if, if I left anything out. Well, I might, I might uh, uh, number one, I mean, Lightning Creek Shelter is stifled for the moment because of a citizen initiated complaint uh, that we're trying to respond to and so and and I think we as we talked uh, we, a number of us feel that at least some level of, of uh, study needs to be provided to that to that facility uh, if, and uh, maybe not to the level that CDA PH &E has stated but uh, at least it's Prove to ourselves and the and the public that uh, uh, we're listening, we're watching, and uh, uh, we are certainly not intending to put anybody in a hazardous situation. So, uh, since that the since that uh, event, uh, that's going to take some time to resolve. So I don't think we can open up immediately. In my mind, that facility next week when we were certainly poised and ready, and. Uh, to provide a constitutionally acceptable alternative to the previous camp. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, I don't think we're in a situation to do that. Uh, that's why I was particularly interested in maybe extending the, their stay at Escalante because that would buy us time so that we could complete that study and in good faith put, uh, open that camp. Uh, so I don't think that's an alternative at this point. 
I think we should go ahead and, under, and continue our due diligence on that site uh, with, a, uh, with some amount of investigation. Uh, but, uh, but, but then the return to social services, if we're looking for a solution also in the current time frame to move these folks out of Escalante and the nurse for, in a week, that's not one that's going to happen. I mean, we've talked about this for about a year and a half at least. And uh, that is not ours to make that decision jointly with, uh, uh, would have to be made with San Juan Basin, or uh, not, excuse me, uh, with uh, Housing Solutions. And uh, as a developer, I, I feel pretty strongly, as like we've talked for months now, about the impact of moving that population uh, onto that property and how it would affect the award of what we're truly trying to achieve, which is permanent supportive housing of 38 beds or something of that nature. And as we know, there's the, as we know, the county certainly knows that uh, any establishment of any camp is not, there's nothing temporary about these camps. Uh, short of an emergency action like they took, uh, there was no easy dismantlement of that camp. And so I don't think that's a position we can afford to be in uh, when, when our goal, end goal, is to provide physical bricks and mortar shelter on that property and the services that come with it. Could, could I clarify one point, and this, yeah. um, maybe Mr. Nelson can correct me, I am not an attorney, um, but in, in all of these discussions and in um, the meetings we've had with the Board of County Commissioners and with the Sheriff's testimony, my understanding was there was a reluctance by the Sheriff and, and later the Board of County Commissioners to close their camp without an alternative place for people to go. Correct. Mm -hmm. So that. if that camp is not existing, what is the um, reason we have to provide a shelter? That was the sole reason in my mind, and uh, Dirk, mm -hmm. <laughs> question is to Dirk, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that's the reason. I mean, that was the, the reason. And uh, not only that, to, to expect uh, enforcement by all of us, by the city, as well as primarily the Sheriff's Department, on the number of other camps that we know exist throughout those uh, fire hazard areas at the, at the ends of our trails outside the city limits. And uh, it appears with the, with the fire classifications that a number of those camps have been vacated, whether they went to Escalante School or, uh, and, and certainly uh, they should be vacated you know, for, for the obvious reason of fire hazard, but uh, uh, Hopefully those people have reached out and got services, whether that's mental health services or uh, housing or uh, some sort of wraparound service to help them and provide them a better place than where they were two weeks ago prior to the fire. But if, I, if I could maybe um, interject one piece, because I, I think um, th this is important to the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we've closed our open space, which includes the, the dog park and Lake Nighthorse, we took the 10 people assigned to Lake Nighthorse, and we have them in groups of two, and they are now out in the open space areas looking for homeless camps. So when that time comes, the council delegated authority to me to uh, reopen our lands when it is safe to do so. So with, as you heard from the fire presentation, there are a lot of moving parts, and uh, these type one guys move quickly. So um, I interpret your delegation to mean if we can get them open, get them open. <coughs> so those 10 people are now out there looking for homeless camps. I need to come back to the council with a supplemental appropriation. We can't do that level of patrol and enforcement um, without adding some seasonal staff. So we're trying to put some numbers together. It could be, you know, six people because the Lake Nine Horse people have to go back when we open Lake Nine Horse. And in what account would you take that out of? Well, you're doing a supplemental appropriation. You're asking us to spend more money. I think we ought to put all the expenses for homelessness in one spot so you can see the magnitude of the impact on our general fund. And that would be the community support page. That would be my recommendation. But um, I would defer to the finance director. We don't want to have an audit problem here, you know. Yeah. Um, Clearly. Yeah. No, I, I agree. And, and that's, that's a really important function to give us the nod to, to allow you to make the decision to open up those lands. Certainly we don't want to, uh, remaining campers 
throughout the rest of the fire season. Uh, that's the whole goal is yeah. to. But we, we want to keep Lake Nyhorst closed just because we're patrolling right. for homeless camps. Right. We can't. And uh, that's that's a lot. That's a lose lose. Uh, so, but uh, the, <coughs> the third option you presented uh, was the Sport Lions uh, in Los Animas. That was presented uh, in our conversations just recently with the state of Colorado when the governor was here. Herb Halter, director of DOLA, suggested if you need a place to, to uh, accept people with appropriate services, a great place, a wonderful environment, and uh, supportive mental health services, uh, jobs, counseling, everything, all the wraparound services, the State Homeless Coalition has created this, this, uh, this Camp, this campus, if you will, uh, for exactly that, for communities around the state that don't have the, the means or the facilities to uh, to uh, provide for these folks. Uh, I think that's a viable alternative, not only in the short term, but um, but let's talk real numbers. I mean, that, we hear it, and thanks for thanks so much for this report. It's really helpful to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, you mentioned 30 to 38 camps moved into Escalante. You know, it'd be real interesting to know how many of those remain. We know, we understand on our, with our reporting that uh, that's dwindled to maybe 10 or 12 individuals. Uh, I don't know if that's ac accurate. That's today, uh, as of yesterday or so. So if, if that is the case, I, I for one think it's the least humane thing to do to put those people back in an outside camp. We can deal, this community can deal with 10 individuals that are homeless, that need help. And whether they want it or what, you know, that's where, you know, we can find a church basement, we can find homes, we can find some way of addressing the homeless issue for only 10 people at this point. If there's more come on board, then, then we've got issues to, uh, then, then we should address that as well. But if, we, if we're actually down to that kind of a number, there's no purpose in opening up a homeless camp or shelter outside, which I've always maintained is the least humane op opportunity for these folks ever. Uh, that, uh, and, and if that's the case, let's get them some help in our community or option number three, which is an existing facility, state sanction, and uh, um, transportation is the issue. I understand some of these folks don't want to go there. They have ties to the community. That's when the community needs to step up and bring those people inside somewhere. 10 of them. We're not talking about 80 to 100 or possibly, as we heard earlier, the camp was, oh, we're expecting as many as 300 travelers this summer. And that didn't happen. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but I, I, my only hope is that all those, that if, if we went from 67 to 80, which was what Ed Aber was reporting earlier a month ago, to down to the 38 or so that you're describing, that's probably fairly accurate. If we're down to 10, that's a manageable sum that we should be able to address in some other fa fashion than opening up a, uh, a shelter uh, by the city of Durango. Councillor Berkey, I see uh, Mr. Hall at the podium. Would it be all right if we, uh, Mr. Hall, you want to contribute? My five minutes is up. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. I just wanted to get you updated. And as Brian pointed out, everything's moving, been moving fast all day. And I was on the phone after five o'clock with. Uh, Access Healthcare in uh, Surratt Leavenworth, and uh, we talked in general about what was going on. And um, she said, "Let me go talk to my staff." And she came back and reported back to me. This was at six o'clock, and um, shared with numbers that are I didn't wasn't privy to the report that was handed out, so I'm not sure what what's on there. But she said there's probably 30 to 40 individuals in uh, maybe half as many tents, um, give or take that are still at Escalante. We did talk about the four lines um, scenario and, and the, the, what she pointed out is the challenge is it's a voluntary situation so you would have to have a willing um, participant. Not to say that that might not be the case with a handful of folks. In fact, she thought there's a few folks out at Escalante that would really fit the bill well, but they have to want to do that. Um, in the meantime, I asked about assessments and whether they're trying to figure out what the needs of the individuals are, and they are very much doing that. They've had people out there the last couple of days. They're going to have someone out there again tomorrow. Um, so they're trying to really get a pinpoint as to where we might be able to help. Uh, when I say we, the community, be able to help 
these individuals. And um, she did offer up that they were doing a number of things, including uh, making sure that these folks are fed because it is somewhat removed from where their meal sources are. Uh, they are going to be providing some transit passes to these folks. If there is the week here ahead, uh, there was a commitment from Access to work as closely as possible to uh, meet some of the needs of the individuals. But uh, I believe where we're at is we do have 30 or 40 individuals who are still out at Escalante um, mm -hmm. that are in the situation that they're in. So I've heard you say that possibly offering Fort Lyons to some people to see if they would be interested. Well, I think that's that's one alternative. If there okay. was a, if you know some persons percentage whatever that might be a viable alternative if it's that many then there are clearly folks that are probably have ties with the community and need to <coughs> remain in the community and uh, but i'd still reach out to uh, I mean, that is a a favorable number of folks uh, you know certainly better than what we've had previously in the camp itself and, and uh, surrounding area so i would i would challenge the uh, the faith community and those folks that you know are trying to help us but uh, to to see what we can do with these 30 to 40 people because there's, there's not going to be any quick solutions as the city managers mentioned uh, to allow us to open up either of these sites uh, or any of the sites that uh, uh, that we've discussed over the past year and a half I'd like to ask um, what the timeline is might be for consulting with Housing Solutions and clearly they, whatever their board meeting is coming up and then also what's how long does it take to make an arrangement for someone to go to Fort, Fort Lyons uh, while Mr. Hall's coming up I'll remark that uh, a few years ago the Southwest Colorado County of Governments was uh, actually I think um, had uh, a grants funded position for uh, homeless and uh, housing and the uh, that went that role went away but in the process we learned a lot about Fort Lyon about Fort Lyons and everything I've heard is that it really is a wraparound service I think the residence time is up to two years they've had a very high success rate in getting people um, the kinds of uh, support they need to get their feet under them and find jobs that enable them to really get on with their lives. So I, I think clearly not everyone will choose to do that, but I think it's an option that particularly if it could become available quickly for some people, uh, everything we can do to diminish the scope of the, the challenge will be a, will help us uh, get to a, a at least tolerable outcome. Mr. Hall? So we heard from Access today that the majority of the folks who are currently at Escalante have ties to the community, whether they're working or they have family or some other uh, support network. Um, and based on what I heard, I, my impression is that they, they weren't real interested in going across the state to the other location. But as I pointed out, um, Ms. Leavenworth said there might be a, a couple of folks in the, in the group. So it might be a partial uh, help to lower the numbers, but probably not the solution to um, addressing what's in front of us here shortly. I also talked to um, uh, Ms. Salkine today from Housing Solutions of the Southwest. <coughs> She pointed out that um, the same issues that were concerning to them before are still a concern. The, the one difference now is, well, there's a couple of differences. Uh, certainly, they're pushing back an application to uh, Colorado Housing Authority for low income housing tax credits. <coughs> one year may provide some wiggle room for them to uh, uh, see that site being utilized a little differently than they anticipated in the short term. Uh, she had significant concern how it would cloud a project if the site was used for any extended period of time. But essentially her takeaway in terms of timing was, well, I need to have conversations with others to really understand the implications here. And her first call, she really wanted to speak with, obviously her board of directors is critical to any decision, uh, but the, uh, the, the 
legal folks from the, the new development team to understand the implications on a LIHTC application if in fact you know, six months from now the site's being used for a particular purpose and they're doing their dil due diligence on a site that is uh, being utilized for other purposes. So she didn't give me a hard and fast uh, timeline in terms of turnaround of comments, but what I think about her is we were having this dialogue tonight and that I'd have an opportunity to get back to her. She's on the road this week, uh, but I can reach, reach out to her as quickly as tomorrow to get a little better sense of timing from her. Uh, in the meantime, um, I would say access said that, you know, the, the situation, while it's challenging, um, it's organized enough right now that they have the ability to really work with each one of the individuals to really pin down the details of what might be helpful um, and whether that includes uh, the uh, Fort Lyon is not determined at this point. Um, but they certainly recognize that. Uh, she pointed out that uh, transportation to Fort Lyon is a little challenging. Um, also, once you're there, apparently it is quite out, um, out in the eastern plains, so it's not real accessible uh, for folks once they're there to come and go. Um, but that was kind of an antidotal view of, of things. But uh, there was nothing but willingness to help in the um, process to see what access can provide to move this forward. Was she looking for like a date if we said, could we move the homeless campers up there until September 1 or August 30? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, with Ms. Selkind, um, her concern was that the, if there was to be use of that site, a couple things would have to happen. Obviously, the agreement we have with them would have to change. Her board would have to support it, and, and it wouldn't also be a situation where it would be problematic for moving forward with an application next year. Um, but in terms of her personal view was that uh, an end date would be really critical to come into any kind of um, consensus among the various parties on her side mm -hmm. as to whether this is functional or not. The concern would be that, you know, that one day the thought is this is what it's going to look like and then if six months later you're still there and it looks entirely different. So she was concerned about an end point. I understand. Okay, now, uh, Councilor? Well, I just want to uh, get a clarification. My recollection about that site at Housing Solutions was that the boundaries of the site where the, the new housing project might go in, uh, that there's a parcel adjacent to that that is is also city-owned property. Is that a correct right? To the, to the south of the social services yes. campus is the what I would call the Elks open space that right. is due east of the cemetery road and which we toured a number of months ago that's almost south of the substation rather than north of the substation if you will so ostensibly if 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 the uh councilors were to find it acceptable for a duration of, of time and we weren't to cloud the housing solution situation we potentially could consider that site and it wouldn't cloud the housing solutions and we wouldn't need their uh, approval for using that site would that be accurate? I think they have no they have no authority or, or control over the site that's um, itself. And it doesn't have an impact. Not to say there. it wouldn't cloud it though. No, but but isn't excuse me, but isn't where we it wasn't that site itself uh, to be part of the expansion of the housing solution service site? No, the social services campus is real well defined, and if you recall the the substation, I'm just going to use that because it generally defines. Social services campus is north. City uh, Elks parcel is, is south of there on that bench. There's a fence there that yeah. separates it. That is the set. And then the, the permanent supportive housing project would be entirely north of that fence line. I think one of the reasons we talked about not using that site is because it's so clearly visible from the road. No, I remember there's all areas. kinds of issues relevant right. to that site, and right. it wasn't ideal for a number of reasons. And But now we're presented with a new set of challenges and time frames. Uh, I guess one of the things that I would just suggest along the lines of continuing your thought process is certainly option three for those that it would be acceptable for in this uh, Los Animas facility. That's great, but it's probably not going to take care of 8% of the overall population that needs uh, some place to go. Ostensibly, unless the sheriff has just totally come to a change of heart, he's going to present us with, if, if these folks are are out and about trying to find camping, uh, and they're camping on county land, he's gonna present us with the same conundrum that we had before, which is, I have to put them somewhere. 
and have some place for them to go, and I'm going to allow them to camp based on their constitutional rights. I guess one thing that I might suggest as part of option two would be to move that idea, option two, outside the boundary of the housing solution site for a defined period of time. It's an emergency ordinance anyways. And, um, and, and consider that while um, our existing site um, at the Lightyear Creek site is under consideration uh, for, for whatever that duration is, it's just something that... I, I appreciate that and uh, a couple thoughts. One is uh, I'd like to see more information on Fort Lyon, you know, what the service is there, what it's like, and if, if, if I was given the offer to move someplace that had food, shelter, and uh, and some job opportunity and some education associated with it. And I would, no matter what my ties to were given community, they can always come back here. And that's what that camp is all about, is rehab and uh, give them a lift up. And so, but, uh, so we can find out from- I, I sent the council a link to the Fort Lyon site. So oh, good, good. it has all of that information. Yeah. The, and, and more importantly, to follow up on Chris, yeah, the, we need to keep in mind what our goal is our original goal was to provide constitutionally acceptable alternative, not a camp. And so as we discuss any of these new options, I mean, we're now turning into a camp, turning into a, camp a domicile. And so if I was uh, uh, the attorney for the developer, uh, and having spent my day today writing a relocation plan for a light tech project, and it took me, it's taken me over a week to figure out how to move 40 people out of a project so that we can do the repairs necessary to, to uh, create new, ha new viable housing. That's A, not cheap, not easy, and we've established, we've created, as the Sheriff's Department did, domicile for that population. So that means they have rights, they have the ability to stay there for as long as they want, so we figure out another alternative, one by one, to move them out, to well, offer me... them a new uh, relocation. So that's not, you know, as we've talked about before, that's not a business we want to get into as the city of Durango. So we're on a kind of a slippery slope moving that direction very, very quickly here because they're sitting there waiting for a new location and it, there is none. Um, what, okay, I have, a, I have a thought. Yeah. Okay. What if we took the cemetery site, the, the one that's south of that, and did the same thing and said it was a sleeping shelter? Do the exact same thing, but make, the, make it uh, storage containers there, the fence, the porta potty, the dumpster, and it doesn't become a tent city. It becomes the same goal that we were looking at as Lightner, which is set up, go to Mana, uh, what's in that? Serata could be at Mana Soup Kitchen working with people on uh, their needs, and then it's the same thing. The tents come down, they go into storage containers. Uh, the same process would be happening. In other words, the tents would, same concept, same rules that you had thought about posting at Lightner Creek, while Lightner Creek is under investigation. That was my suggestion. I wasn't suggesting that we evolve okay. the idea any further than we already did. Okay, but all right. But I also wanted to ask uh, our council, just if, if you, Dirk, if you were to create a scenario where option three was available to this population and it was a good option and it had all of these uh, components to it. Would you would you feel that that met the constitutional requirement that has been bandied about here as a rationale <coughs> that we have had in the community to provide a safe place to sleep? Or well, I, first of all, I would say that there's nothing in any of the cases <coughs> that puts that the burden to provide shelter on the government entity. If you look at all these situations in other places, the vast majority of those are operated by entities other than the government. So we could, you know, just on a technical So, so I think the answer to your question is, is it reasonable to ask people to go 250 miles or whatever it is to an, op, you know, here's an opportunity. I think that partially, uh, I mean, we can't force them to go there. So that certainly meets, you know, part of that uh, criteria. But if we can't force them to go there, we. You, in your view, we, we would still not have an obligation to provide uh, a shelter at this juncture relevant to the one we've been discussing, the camp. camp well, I mean, again, I think that if you look at the cases that have uh, come down on this issue, 
They're all in big cities. They're all Los Angeles. They're all uh, Seattle. Those kind of places where there really aren't any, you know, that, that there are shelters, there just aren't enough places for them. <coughs> Here, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so again, I, just to make it clear, I don't think there's any obligation, constitutionally or otherwise, that that shelter be provided by the city. If, as Councilor Brookie suggested, you could find nonprofits or churches or individuals who would agree to house folks, that would be just as acceptable. There's no, uh, you know, there's no requirement that it be done by a certain individual or, or an entity. But at this uh, moment in time, no churches have said, Mr. Hall. No churches have said they would open their doors. Is that correct? Well, the conversations we've, we've had with primarily the um, Community Compassion Outreach, um, there's been no support or indication that they were going to be able to find places for folks. And the, uh, that same group also said they weren't interested in kind of, uh, gatekeeping, if you will, or providing oversight of, of a sheltering location. Is that the same group that also wrote to the CDPH meeting? Correct. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but well, you have. I just wanted to make sure. And this is, I'm just, it's kind of fact finding right now. It's not making a suggestion, but so in other words, if the council and their good wisdom was to say, you know, we'd like to pursue option three and offer this opportunity and fund transportation, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. then in your view, we're not in violation of the constitutional rights of these individuals. Certainly not, because they would have to agree to go there and undertake that program. So I think that would be perfectly acceptable. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pumpkin? If there was a um, private land owner <coughs> or parcel of land that could accept uh, homeless residents in, to sleep, it, what, it is, in the city, what are our land use codes around that? I think it could be problematic. <laughs> I mean, I think that I'll defer to the community department, uh, development department director for that. Then I would ask the same that, question about the county land use. Oh, too. county. I, but just out of curiosity. I think, I think there would probably have to be some waivers of some of their regulations to do that. Uh, but I think well. this is an emergency situation. Mm -hmm. and it's an emergency ordinance. We could dedicate it on a private property if the citizen who owned the property was willing to okay. participate in the process, much like we did with our own property. Much like we do with our own Would there property. have to be public readings and, or public you know, hearings? Mm -hmm. well, well, just the announcement, just like we did the last time, that was a hearing only because people participated in public. Yeah, and, and I can't comment about the county process. I don't, I don't know anything about that. But I think it's possible that council wants to say if, if a private property owner wanted to step up, let's say they had a vacant building that, you know, could be used to house people, I think on an emergency basis and a temporary basis, we probably could do that. Um, but, so I think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, technically speaking, if a church wanted to say, we'll let them stay in our lawn, that may or may not be technically legal, but I think we could probably find a way to make that work. Mm -hmm given the situation that we're in right it's been tried tried the episcopal church tried that a few years ago mm -hmm. but it's a different time and place today mm -hmm. yeah i think we have yeah, a different I think perspective. One, one of the issues for the for the churches is liability mm -hmm. uh, and as we know the insur you know insurance regulations constrain a lot of options for various people so well, that's uh, that I know you know I know from at least one conversation that that is an issue and so but not to say that we shouldn't turn every stone um, well it's just a timing issue right? yeah, even if that much. were a relevant outcome then do we have the time to make that one happen certainly could pursue it but if we really are right. down to a week right. yeah. I have one more can I ask one more legal question it just it just to backtrack a little bit just because today it was you know we, we learned about the um, lease and the wording in the lease and it's really an option um, can you, we, yeah can you explain that because I feel like we need to be informed as to exactly what that is yeah w what we did was because housing solutions said we will pursue permanent supportive housing but we need to in order to go get those that funding, we need to prove up that we have unfettered access and use of that property. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we granted an option to them that their uh, granting agencies find acceptable. 
Uh, so we, uh, and then we did the same thing, as you recall, uh, out in Three Springs, similar arrangement. So at this point, I think it's framed as an option, but they have the option to, to lease it. Uh, and to, you know, if they get funding. So we've agreed and council agreed to give them, uh, you know, the option to, to lease it. So it's a, can you explain? They have an option if they get the grant, but can you explain how, I mean, it, yeah. stop us from immediate, you know, immediate use as, a, as if, if we needed it for an emergency situation. I, I think it would prevent us from making any use that would impair them in their process of trying to get funding and build the project. And I think that's what Council Brookie was just describing, is that they have, they have a fear, and I think it's well-founded, that if people are occupying that property, okay. that as part of their process, they would have to figure out a way to so it's really cease the same that, that, that occupancy. And, yeah. and it's not only that property. I mean, the, the evaluation is the surrounding neighborhood. Surrounding neighborhood. It basically is to impact the community. It impacts the, the viability of that, of that, uh, of a project of that nature. And so, I mean, we would have to tell the, that developer that we have it under control, that we can, at, you know, upon their funding, uh, vacate that property. And I think you can look at the county and look just that far and say, I don't think that's a guarantee that we can we can make. But if it was a legally, if it's just a sleeping shelter, if it's if you know if. Uh, if, if our determination is that, yeah, that they have not established domicile, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, that's why I, I would like them to have a domicile <laughs> inside somewhere where it's convenient and that they can get on with their life as opposed to putting them in um, what I'm afraid it would be labeled a cage, just like <laughs> some of these uh, shelters on the, on the border. You know, the, it's, uh, the conversation that I had with Ms. Salakai today really reflective of some of the things I've heard here and it was really about if there was a, a window where you're testing to get assurances on the other side and there was a it was a limited time that uh, she was comfortable having those conversations with the, the folks in her organization as well as the development team mm -hmm. to make a determination of what the impact might be. Um, it, it felt like a whole different um, perspective than we're just going to put it here and we don't know when it might go away. Right. Um, so there was a higher comfort level with doing it on a short-term basis. Clearly the option lease, it's a two-year, and we did that so that we weren't just giving them a lease on property for 99 years without any assurances of a development occurring. So we said, you have two years to prove up that you can make this project work. Because they passed on this year's first round of LIHTC, they have one more year on their option. If they don't bring it together in the second year, the option just goes away, and then it's a start-over situation. Um, but I, I don't want to um, discount the possibility or for us as staff to look at that if in fact this is where council wants to go, whether it's the Elks parcel or this parcel, I think it warrants more conversation with Housing Solutions to determine whether um, that site um, is, is viable through the agreement we have with them and how it might, as we've talked in past cloud, something. I would suggest that we would focus more on the Elks parcel because at least it doesn't cloud it that directly. We know that. Mm -hmm. And we know they're not in process right now. They don't have anybody coming on site to right. inspect the site until they do. And we could give them a date specific by which we would have another solution because this is truly a, a okay. staging facility uh, based on the proven viability of another option and or the implementation of option three in its full realization. Maybe that's truly the best outcome, but I would suggest it would take the county uh, health and human services folks a while to implement something like that and to help people adjust to something. We're not going to get that done in a week. So I, I do think we're going to have to create, you know, um, unless Escalante were extended, and it sounds like that's not a possibility, we're going to have to create some sort of, of place transitional to our original designated place and or transitional to this facility in Los Animas. And that place to me, the best suited place, and it would take conversation with Ms. Salkind and, and her board, even if we put on the Elks property, would most likely be the Elks property next door. I mean, that seems like the most viable solution for this small number of people that we're talking about in an emergency situation that has an expiration. Um, and it is a daily, it's not a permanent situation, just like the mayor described. 
I would, I would, I mean, for the available information is here with <laughs> me now, I would say that's the, the best thing I can see on this chart. Chris, I like what you said about the, uh, the expiration. You know, if, if whatever, we, if we take action um, and it's given a date certain that this is clearly an emergency situation, um, the, the homeless camp got shut down for fire and safety reasons, then we're finding ourselves that we don't want to send these people back up into unregulated areas. Uh, uh, or dispersed. If there's no other options for them, this is it. And uh, let's do it for, what do you think, in a, a month or two months or? I mean, do we have any sense of how long it's going to take to get some clarity on the testing that we would need to do on the? The short answer is we don't have an absolute, but uh, given um, staff understanding how long it takes to go through a process of hiring someone to do environmental analysis with a state review of that work and then their determination as to its um, you know, uh, outcome. Um, I, I think it's very safe to say two to three months before you see any kind of resolution from CDPH and E. Could, could I add so that we're all prepared for a um, possible Response. So let's say we do the, the test. The test could say it's not safe. The test could say it is safe. The test could say we need more tests because it's inconclusive. Um, you may not get the answer to the first two, which are definitely yes or no. Um, so then it's like the car that, you know, the muffler needs to be repaired, then you need to buy new tires, and then, you know, all of a sudden, you probably should have made a different discuss, you know, decision on your car. Um, I, I, I think these tests could go on for some time. Well, I think we go into, this has to be eyes wide open no matter what. I mean, we have to go into a decision here where <clears throat> the expected outcome of any testing over there is all manner of things. So, But we still would need a date specific on how long we could potentially be adjacent to the housing solutions facility because that is the long game. That is the best outcome, and we can't cloud that outcome. And so this right. has to have, you know, it, the original emergency ordinance was for how long? Is it 30 days? 60 days. 60 days? It was 60 originally, and we, we renewed it. Because we've canceled July meeting, we'll probably have to set a short special meeting for one of the study sessions. Uh, I think it expires on the 14th of July, I think. So the next meeting is set at the 17th. It dawned on me today that cancel because I wasn't aware of your canceling the July meeting until today so we probably will so the answer to your question is it's currently expires uh, in about a month so I, I, I I'm kind of ready to make a decision so if there's other comments I don't have one to make comments <laughs> and I would point out this item is technically not agendized this came up quickly so we may want to do it as guidance to staff more than like a study session yeah. kind of guidance more than a, a vote. vote because it isn't technically agenda here. So. Uh, sure, sure, I would comment. I I just recognize <clears throat> that this is an extremely difficult situation that we're in as um, a, a community, an entire community, with stage three fire restrictions all around, and therefore the county's changed their stance, the sheriff has changed their stance, and we as a city are trying to help and um, it's a very difficult situation and I do think we have people out there that need a place to go and I appreciate Councillor Bertine bringing, bringing this up. It's a difficult, it's a difficult topic. It's a difficult because we recognize that we have limited options. We have limited resources and also the entire community needs to recognize that this is difficult to manage. A shelter is difficult to manage. It requires personnel, time, and energy, and we're going to need, I think, some help. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the community, if, if we decide to move forward in this direction, recognizes the impact that it's having, it, that it will have on our city staff and on um, and our city budget, um, because it's a difficult situation. On the other hand, I think we have people that need our help and they need our support and I think we should do what we can do. Councillor White, thoughts? Well, all of my thoughts have to do with 
none of the options happen quickly um, even if housing solutions is amenable um, I don't know how long it would take for them to make a formal decision to amend the lease agreement uh, we would have to also act to amend the lease agreement not the use the adjacent parcel we don't have that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. But, well, yeah, but, oh, so, okay, it's, so we don't, so that doesn't take formal action from us. It does engage um, some other actors who might just say, we don't want to take that risk. Um, the, uh, you know, if a couple of, if, if some people are willing to go to Fort Lyons, um, every bit helps push comes to shove uh, if we're going to do something it might have to be what we were preparing to do even though we cannot complete testing but if the alternative is to say well sorry you know is to do nothing all you know do nothing is still on the table but what does that mean and and uh, I you know I, I'm loath to uh, say okay well you can use the the Lightner Creek site, I am willing to say what I said at the study session last week, that as, as a physicist to understand something about radioactivity, and as a homeowner who has remedied, remediated um, radon in my home, the remediation is you put down impervious plastic and ventilate it, which is what a good ground, ground cloth does. There's still a public perception issue there, but it's simply, if, if we cannot do something else, then I think we have to do that. Um, and uh, the, you know, we could indeed provide plastic sheets to provide that coverage um, until some testing could take place. One could still uh, do, um, just the seat of the pants, get the, um, I don't know how much they cost. I know that Wendy Rice gives them away, uh, radon testing kits, because I've got one in my basement that I haven't, that I haven't, I've been meaning to retest. Um, the, you know, one could put up a tent overnight and see if you get a signal. Uh, my guess is almost certainly not, because usually these things take, you know, you have to do a test that's long enough. Uh, is it good? No, none of these options are good. Um, the situation, as we've been talking about repeatedly, is a wicked problem. Uh, we've got conflicts of values. We're trying, one, you know, and the preeminent value in our discussions for the last m six months or more has been the safety of the larger community from fire. And we have a fight. We know that. Uh, we don't want another one starting. Uh, from people who said, well, I can't stay in Durango, I'll go back in the hills. Um, the, that, that would be, I think, the worst possible outcome. Mm -hmm. the, and so, um, if we could get the social service parcel up and running um, soon, and say, okay, get a, you know, let's get people off of that site for now, and while we have it tested, go to the social services site as soon as possible. But to provide something for, you know, what we, the goal here was to provide a legal place for people to sleep. And I think that's still the goal. No one except, no one thinks, I surely don't think that's a good solution. Um, that's why we've been told that most people wouldn't want to use it. I don't, I know I wouldn't, but it comes down to, well, we all have to make choices, and we have to make choices for the good of our whole community. And I believe that the risk of camping on that site is small. I would have no, not the slightest hesitation to do it myself. Um, and the, and I think the, uh, if we have to do that it, it, as something we can do in the next week, I think we have to do that while we, you know, give the direction to staff 
to say, hey, if we can get this other possibility, hooray. Uh, that would eliminate the, the safety concern with the Lightner Creek site. But, uh, so it's sort of, you know, in desperation, go ahead with Lightner Creek when people need it, which might be in a couple of days, it might be tomorrow. Um, and as soon as possible, find out if the uh, social services site would be possible and also make sure that people get in the queue for, for Fort Lyons uh, if they're willing to, willing to do it. I, I, I thought Dean broke it down really well at the beginning when he talked about the steps. When you, when you eliminated the uh, Lightner Creek site based on the testing not taking place there yet, I was in agreement with that wholeheartedly and also understand what you're, what you're seeing, Dick. But I mean, if I were to frame what the direction would be to the staff, it would be to pursue the uh, social services campus adjacency uh, as an option, as option one, simultaneous with pursuing option three for as many people as are interested in the Los Alamos animus uh, opportunity, uh, and then put a date specific on it on the use of that parcel, whatever that parcel is, uh, meaning 30 days, 60 days, whatever you feel is appropriate. Uh, and it's the same utilization structure that we had already decided upon, which is it's not a permanent camping situation. Um, and then simultaneously, we're pursuing the taste testing of uh, the Leitner Creek site uh, to determine the safety of that particular site, ostensibly with the path of potentially moving to that site. That would be my framing of the direction. I don't know if we have any. I think I'm hearing a couple of ideas, though. So his idea is try to set up at the Elks. Correct. Elk site, sleeping shelter, just like we have planned at Leitner. Proceed with the testing at Leitner. Correct. And put a, a time limit of, say, August the 31. Somewhere and make sure that it's a, a sleeping shelter, not tent city and also Is work on hearing? yeah and also work on potential the relocation for Fort the Lions. Fort Lyons folks who are interested in that option okay I heard that proposal then I heard from Councillor White uh, open up now maybe I had heard well, I'm, you know what I'm uh, what I'm hearing is that um, this even that option could cloud the the okay. use of the other property I don't think so. I didn't hear that. I heard if, you know, putting if, people at Housing Solutions might cloud it, but not a, where the fence is across the line where the Elks property yeah, is. I, you know, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's possible, but I think if it's carefully done, um, but that was that's something we would have to pursue. I mean, again, this just came up today. So. Well, I think the city has to go and talk to Housing <clears throat> Solutions no matter what. Right. right. If it's adjacent or it's on the property, they still have to be involved in that decision, and they have to agree that it's the right path. Right. for their purposes because that's the bigger picture yeah so i think yeah the mechanics of uh, the number of parties that we have to negotiate with at the social services site are m much more complex than doing you know, what dick's talking about which is mm -hmm. bite the bullet continue with the testing but keep on with the original program that we open up lightner creek open up lightner creek. Creek. that, that way you don't have to deal with you know you don't have any legal agreements you don't have any uh you don't have POA waking up tomorrow and having an issue. You don't have um, Hilltop House having an issue. You don't have all those entities that are already occupying that space uh, coming back to life. Mike, they thought this was dead. I appreciate it. My concern with it is the viability of the option, whether it would be used. I think that's why we're all, like, why we, well, we're considering that, the that second. Is, that's, the, that's, that's still an unknown. Can I finish? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I, it is an unknown and we won't know until we know, but I, I think that the you know, um, discussions that I've had with individuals close to the homeless are that, you know, it, that it, it wouldn't be a, a, vi a very viable alternative. What we risk with that is exactly what Councillor White was suggesting is that then they just go further and deeper into the woods if they don't want to go to a site that hasn't been deemed safe. That's why we brought it up and that's I think why we got support to do the testing in the first place. So that's just it's a concern I think we need to consider in making this decision. Like I said, no good options. They're all very difficult for us, but we, well, what, we do, what we do do, it would be nice to have it 
I think I'm hearing two different things. You are. I'm you hearing, are. I'm hearing you are. this side <laughs> and this side. So um, then we also have uh, uh, our mayor. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we know it's going to be a sleeping shelter no matter where it is, uh, at the Elks or at the uh, um, Lightner Creek shelter. And uh, I hear Fort Lyons offer that. Is that what I'm hearing? Counselors not offer that. I think offer that, that. You should be looking at that for whoever's willing for, for to For anyone who wants to go. Sure. Anyone but, who wants to go. So the current benefit of Lightner Creek is that, that we see that as a fairly long-term solution, not ending in August. I think if we are in negotiation with these other property owners that we're talking August in a temporary. So like, how many times can these people be relocated? You know, well, it's I, like I, we're playing whack-a-mole. I, you know, I, I would just posit that had the one entity that we brought up earlier not clouded that site at the Lightner Creek site, we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's and those are the same people that are purporting that they're trying to help this community and they're making it as difficult as possible for us to help them. So I, I just want to throw that out on the table because I think that that is the reality of why we're having this discussion. Right. And, and so we will have to go through the exercise now. And I, you know, it is, it's, it's how it's changed. Mm -hmm. And it's changed because of that I interception. And, and that's, I, 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 I would personally feel more comfortable. And I think we discussed this at length the other night about the testing if we went ahead and went through some, even if it wasn't a full phase one environmental, but it was a demonstration of the safety of that site on some level uh, before we asked anyone to go there based on our hypothesis, which is most likely true, that it isn't going to harm anybody. And so I, I know that that would cause people to have to move, but uh, you know, I think uh, to Councillor Youssef's point, they, they uh, may feel more comfortable doing that because of the unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to get a kind of a consensus from city council. We know we don't allow camping on city property. We've heard the city manager say he's going to put uh, boots on the ground to make sure that doesn't happen. And uh, then we, we did ask the sheriff to enforce the law if the stage three changes to stage two to enforce the law in the county. And that was some of your concerns about people going deeper into the woods. So the, I, the way to prevent that or to uh, initiate that is to make sure that the sheriff knows that this city council wants him to do his job. Is that, is that what I'm hearing from you, Mayor uh, Proton? Yes. Okay. All right. And I think I'm hearing that from everyone else. The sheriff needs to do his job and when things change. So I've yeah. heard from well, okay. I you know I, um, you know what, uh, Councilors Yusuf and Tina just stated, um, I find pretty persuasive. I mean, I think if the if the concern about safety is going to diminish the likelihood that it works by enough, then maybe we should just go ahead. But uh, my concern is that we may have no more than a few days. And the wheels that have to turn around the other site, uh, not least of which is an emergency ordinance, um, are going to take some time. We have the option in place. Nobody has says we just absolutely can't use Lightner Creek. I wholeheartedly agree that nobody one really would want to. But. I think that's an option, a legal option. A legal option that I think we need to make available. And I and I know there's you know you know that means trying to set up some staffing there and as well as some yeah. other you know the, the logistics are complicated. But well, it's direction of staff too, right? And, and it's you know and we're not making a firm. Yeah, you know, actually, it would be a decision would have to be an emergency ordinance to authorize it. Yeah, I do think that is the next option. I mean, it's, you can't pull out the one that I'm describing that you do have to go to that to that option to yeah. like reset. Well and if I can cl clarify on your question about the sheriff enforcing just a little clarification is that by doing what we're doing whatever step we take is a temporary emergency ordinance then you know the sheriff and the county and you know they can, they can enforce um, whereas if we did the fourth option of do nothing then it, it really does put us back in that same situation of where we were in 2014 
where um, due to limited resources, they ended up finally saying in the county, we have more ability to enforce, but the county likely less so. So therefore, we would find ourselves likely potentially in a similar situation that we were back in 2014, and then the circle goes on. Yeah. Whereas this, we're, we're, we're actually addressing it um, with a solution so that we can enforce all throughout the county and city, no camping, there's a place for them to go, even after the fires subside. Yeah. I, I respect all of it, and now kind of my head's gone back full circle to, mm -hmm. how, can the, how can the county sheriff in good conscience after what these uh, things that we've had to do over the past year of negotiations and <coughs> discussion about his interpretation of constitutionality, just unilaterally shut down the camp and throw it in our lap. He did. I mean, that's that's what's happened here mm -hmm. for the public to know as well. Uh, and so we, like we were before, are ready to pick up the ball, but certainly less legally necessary as the city manager was talking about <coughs> why are we doing this i mean they shut down the camp and let they created this void yes right now i mean and and, and they've had no conversation with us about that in terms of what any strategy they had all we know is they just closed the camp i guess that constitutionality didn't matter did it Loosely applied, I guess. Yes, I don't well, think, I think it. I think maybe it has to do with the stage three fires. Yeah, exactly. And I respect that, but we can claim the same thing. Um, yep. We felt. If if we move in this direction, um, if council decides to direct staff to move in this direction. One of the things that uh, is a little bit concerning right now is that there are, given that they're closing it down. Um, Currently, there's some of the residents, I understand there's not sanitation facilities available. And so I think that somehow, if we're going to move to provide temporary location, that we would want to ensure that we try to address that as soon as possible in some way. Do you mean at Escalante? I'm Correct. confused. Okay, what you're saying is you're asking the city. There's no porta potties there right now. Okay, so you're asking this city manager to move something in with, with it, the superintendent's or to permission? Work with the superintendent somehow. Yeah communicate obviously we'll have them at our temporary location but wherever they currently are they should have sanitation facilities w would it be reasonable for the council to uh, meet with the county commissioners like in the next couple days and listen to their explanation um because i'm hearing two different standards there's the standard that the city will spend money that we don't have, but we're accepting the county's um, statement have. that they're that they're not they don't have money either. Mm -hmm. I don't. Well, what would we what would we accomplish listening to them? I mean, I, I think they close their camp, and they don't care. They don't seem to care what happens, and they're looking. I think it's the city cares and city's going to pick up the pieces. But I don't think that they seem to care. That was a quick decision with no uh, input from anyone else. And a canceled meeting to discuss in the first place without rescheduling the meeting. Um, you know, if we don't pick up the pieces here, we're back, we're right back to square one. I mean, we're right back to where, you know, and who knows what site they choose next time that's inaccessible and impactful to uh, both the population and the community at large. You know, we have no control over what that ha what happens there. Whereas if we, you know, we do have, we know we have 38 individuals that need to have a place to safely sleep based on the past performance of the sheriff. And so if we don't, if we choose the no, do nothing route, I think we're just putting ourselves, right, we're putting ourselves in a dispersed right. camping situation mm -hmm. and or who knows what the sheriff is going to do there. Um, I don't think we don't have time for that. I don't think I heard do nothing over here. Yeah. I know what you're, you're proposing, and I don't, I, mean, I don't think I heard do nothing. No, no, I was just making a point that uh, mm -hmm. this is, at this point, it becomes uh, sort of a humanitarian effort on the part of the city of Dragon. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so. And we have to find the money. Yeah, and, and, that's, <laughs> and that's, that's the call also to 
are, you know, community nonprofits and churches. Um, but I think there's help. one call that specifically we can make, and I'd like to see how much room they have in their basement, because that's why we're here tonight talking about this. I agree. <laughs> Wholeheartedly, I'll make it with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's to Durango Christian Church. Is that who you're referring that's to? That's exactly right. That's uh, exactly right. They need to if they're going to continue to push us down the road and thwart the, the, the good the months of activity that we put into this solution. They need to have a solution as an alternative before they start calling the state of Colorado. I think that's a fair comment from you, Councilor uh, Berkey. So, oh, okay, so staff needs a direction then. That's what I'm hearing. So it's time to, to uh, talk about which direction you're going. And I, I heard you say Elks and sleeping shelter and temporary couple, two, couple of months. Is that what you're proposing? I need a little help here. 60 days. 60 days, and then and that would be enough time for the radon testing maybe to be over Hopefully, with? Hopefully, and then we may have to extend it another 30 based on that timing, but that's the timing it will be based upon. And it would be strictly a sleeping shelter, no change from what we had proposed at Lightner Creek. I don't think we have to re-adjudicate that. We've done all that work at this point. No change in the model. No change in the model. Yes, good words. And it also gives the campers an alternative, you know, a time to sort out things and figure out alternatives themselves and, and figure out if this is a, a forever thing. Uh, of camping on the fringe of Durango or in Durango and, and uh, how else can we help them and you know so far this is the most action I've seen by us uh, those access health care San Juan Basin Health we've act we've activated those folks to be participants in the solution now and uh, I think that's working that part is hopefully providing some alternatives are you supporting the uh, Elks property I'm a little no I'm, I'm just saying that, okay uh, this, the timing allows the campers to figure mm -hmm. out another option mm -hmm. than, than what is currently out there. Uh, so I've, I, I go for the Elks uh, in a 60 day emergency setup. Okay. So I think that's what our community will tolerate personally. I agree. Yeah. That's, yeah, I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, it's not our decision, it will be a community decision. Are you? Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, with the one caveat that. I don't know how long it will take. Uh, to step at the Elks? I don't think it'll take long at all. Um, <laughs> she said, I don't see your tool belt on. Huh? Could, could, could I maybe offer a suggestion that may not be um, well received, but I feel obligated? Um, would the council tolerate letting them camp there until we get our equipment in and the, the staff hired and then we can go from an overnight go from a yeah a camp to a shelter because uh, we have to get somebody there um, and that may not happen in a week and if we have another day like we had today where the cops have to keep showing up it's not fair to 9r that is they're trying to do what um, the, the good thing is for the community and they're getting stung by bad behavior okay so i'm so I'm saying we can tell them now they can move to the to the Elks Club, club and Elks. camp. Not the club, the, the property. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. I hope, I hope sorry. next door. That's a good idea. Yeah. It's a nice Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Hope they're not watching on TV next door because they'll be filing in here. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, right but now. let them camp there. We'll get something up and running in let's say seven to ten days. Then the rules change and they have to. Abide, uh, by, abide by the rules. Budget, which would be a sleeping shelter. Correct. That's the same model. Correct. Okay, I think we can all live with that. Otherwise, we're going to keep having conflicts with 9R and the same thing. We're going to have to pay for the porta potty anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just get it in the right spot. I don't know, Kevin, are you okay with that? And it, we can make it. <laughs> yes, say yes, Kevin. <laughs> yes, and then a dumpster. And, uh, some and the lockers. Temporary the fencing and the lockers are already ready to go. I know that. And um, and as long as the community knows that this is temporary. For but 60 days. But we're not going to let them camp there for 60 days. That's exactly right. So you're saying that they can put up a tent and be They can do what they're doing now at Escalante and then uh -huh. we'll give ourselves a, a quite a few days to get it set up with the rules and then they, they have to... Abide by, abide by the rules. 
by and, you know, I just encourage you to engage. It sounds like they're pretty organized to engage with them to help. Well, here are two things. Um, to, no, to engage with them to make the rules, because we've talked about that all along. Whatever those rules are, I think they should be part of that process. But um, well, we, we can do that, but we still have laws in this city. You can't be beating people up and stealing their stuff. No, no, I'm not suggesting that you, you could. I'm just asking you to work with them to, uh, to make it successful. I don't think you've seen the, the rules, but uh, Mr. Hall has a copy of the rules for the right. sleeping shelter. Right. And he can but provide... Just that the, the rules were the rules we adopted from the ones that all the campers worked with the sheriff's department Perfect. on creating. Perfect. So I don't think we need to go back and redo the wheel here. We took those rules and we modified them, um, took out some of the subjectivity on them and cleaned them up. And those were the rules we were intending to put in place. My sense is that like today and yesterday, things evolve. So if there needs to be some adjustments, we adjust as we move forward. Okay. All right, I think uh, yeah, well, one last comment, comment too. I mean, we're okay. talking about a known quantity of folks that obviously checked into the evacuation <coughs> facilities. Are we going to open this up to new travelers? Well, um, that's a good um, question to clarify. At the um, relocated camp, the sheriff was not letting new travelers in. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, where we should be then, as a site. I mean, we've got names. We, we have, they have to have a rapid tag to be at the Escalante sh shelter. So mm -hmm. we have these records. I, I would like to say that that's the limit of our obligation. I mean, we're, we're trying to help these people out that were displaced and have been previous occupants of this camp. And we're not reaching out to new communities to, to accept in, uh, 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 new campers. And what I heard from Access today was the the majority of the folks that they've talked to over there are people who have been in this community for quite some time. Correct. Yeah. And uh, for various reasons, and it's not your, I guess, uh, travelers as you refer to. <clears throat> so, one more level of complication. <laughs> but I, I don't know what, if there's any consensus on that or not, or if that's too harsh. No, I, I think that's reasonable, uh, Councilor Berkey. Uh, <laughs> that you're trying to help the people that were displaced, that they're here. Many have already, some have already left. I, I know that. And we're offering the, the Fort Lyons uh, opportunity. So that's another possibility. And we'll go forward with our Lightning Creek shelter testing. And I think city manager is going to make sure that there's people out in the, our open space uh, when that time happens to make sure that campers aren't there because that's just not legal and not safe for our community. So uh, I, I support that, that, that in tag. In a sense, this is an alternative evacuation center. Yeah, I, I think that, that's what I was about to say, that it's really an extension of the whole stage three fire, mm -hmm. fire uh, restrictions and the evacuation and the evacuation of people who have domiciles um, is mostly done, we hope. And, um, but we've got this special population who, um, whom we can accommodate in this way in the very short term and then revert t toward the solution that we were, have been struggling with. Uh, I think that's, I, I thank the manager for that suggestion. I think that really helps. If I could just suggest that um, I think it's appropriate for the camping portion of it for when they're camping that it, they have to have the rapid take because those are the ones that have been camping and they should but but I would just I want to clarify with council that when it converts to a shelter I think also what we were trying are, are we going to try to place are we trying to provide a place for homeless residents people who become homeless even after this to sleep or, or is that not our goal here I would, we just... I, I, would, I, I would think that once the immediate emergency is over and we've got a shelter, a, in place. a shelter inadequate as it is in place, then I think that should be what's available to not just the evacuees, but to other homeless residents. Uh, yeah, acknowledging that we're, as uh, the county is in Fort it continues their enforcement, hopefully, and and we have boots on the ground in our open space, that there may be uh, 
additional campers that need a spot, but it didn't go to the evacuation center, but are uh, right. in violation of stage three fire restrictions currently that would need a sh an evacuation Safe. shelter. That's why I like that term because it, uh, it eliminates the concept of domicile mm -hmm. for as long as they might, and, and for as long as we call it an evacuation center. Not, and, and so maybe there's additional folks that uh, if they need shelter from stage three fire evacuation, then that's who could go there. Okay. That makes sense to me. But, but not somebody rolling in from right. Tucson. Okay, I think you, uh, is that, are you okay, city manager with, and staff with uh, direction? I think we're heading. Maybe. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, now we're at the portion of called council reports and actions. So would anyone like to uh, begin, Councilor Bettine? I'll pass. Thank you. All right, Councilor, uh, Mayor Pochett. Good move to put it at the end when you get tired. No, I'm yeah. going to pass. Okay. All right, Councilor Berkey. I always have something to say, but I think I'll refrain. Okay. Councillor Wine. Uh, I will not refrain. Um, I do will observe that I'm giving, I still have my office hours Thursday mornings at 9 to steam and bean if I don't have a conflicting meeting. And as far as I know, I don't have one until middle of July. Uh, I think an important point was that uh, there is now a Southwest Colorado disaster assistance site yes. to help both individuals who are needy and individuals who want to help um the there's a faith they have a facebook page and a twitter account the facebook page is at facebook.com slash swcda um, i also found the relevant things with a um, they don't have a web page so if you look under disaster assistance <coughs> go on a google search you'll find the relevant links um, i think that's important information for for the entire community. Um, the community engagement process is still going forward. The next meeting is Monday the 25th, next Monday night. Uh, it's a really important meeting uh, underlying the fiscal needs that are getting further stressed as we've been discussing tonight. Um, council's not meeting on July 3rd. 4th of July events are coming and the primary election deadline gives receipt of ballot by the county clerk by next Tuesday. Thank you. Uh, just to note, I'd like to thank the police department for working hand in hand with the county sheriff's office. I'd like to thank the city staff working hand in hand during this fire with the county uh, staff. Uh, the city manager has been uh, giving the city council uh, lots of information and we certainly appreciate it. Uh, we all have been to many meetings. Uh, most of you should know that Governor Hickenlooper was here and uh, you know Durango's open for business. So I'm going to encourage everyone out there to get on social media and put a great picture of Durango and just say come to Durango for vacations. Durango's open for business. Vicedo is great. Silverton it's a wonderful uh, place to visit, and that's going to help everyone and lift all boats. So there we go. And thank you so much. And tonight, the city council is concluded.